I work as a teletech while I'm in school. And when the unit secretary leaves for lunch, I will cover the desk for the time being, since it's right outside the telly room. I was sorting the heart rhythm strips and someone walks up to the desk and said he was looking for the exit. I pointed in the direction right as I looked up to acknowledge him standing there and saw he was in a gown with a wristband. So I asked him his room number and to wait while I called his PCA to walk with him downstairs. I called the PCA and gave her the room number. She told me, that can't be the right room. The patient died about 20 minutes ago. Was it his family? I told her he had a wristband on, or maybe I had heard or was given the wrong room number. She came to the desk to cover the monitors for me, and I went to peek in the room he told me to see, to see if it was the wrong room and find out which room he was in. Sure enough, laying dead in the bed was the same guy who walked up to the desk no longer than 10 minutes before I went in there. This is a story told to me by my uncle, who was in his 60s, and I will be telling it from his perspective. This happened in the late 80s. In these times, or rather this decade, I was a heavy home hopper. I could not stay home for more than five to six months. In what I believe to be 1987, I moved into my first house after having many apartments beforehand. But that's just too little background for the story. So now I will tell you the story of one life-changing experience that still gives me nightmares. It was late evening and I had just got back from a walk that I would usually take to help keep my mind clear. I forgot what time it was, but I'm going to estimate somewhere after nine because I had to be up the next morning for work. So I took a shower, hopped out, got dressed, and then went back to bed, which was probably around 10 now. I woke up at four in the morning to a window clash. I jumped straight up half asleep and half awake. Was it just my dream that scared me into think a glass broke? I asked myself this, but then I heard footsteps. After hearing this, I jumped right into action shut my door and dialed the cops from the house phone that I had in my room. When they picked up, I whispered that there was a robbery going on in my home. They told me to get inside a locked room, make no sound until they could arrive. I whispered back that I'm in a locked room and to please hurry, and they assured me that there were two cars on their way to my house immediately. Still feeling no help, I whispered okay, then hung up the phone shaking. I told myself it was going to be all right, and whoever was down there wasn't going to know I was there. Or, if they did, they weren't going to be able to get in, because the door was locked. Boy, was I wrong. Two minutes later, after telling myself this, I saw the door rattle. I was way more shaken and in fear now, but I remember again that the door was locked. But then the door opened, like it was never locked. Who had slid into my room was the intruder and he made eye contact with me as soon as he stepped in. I now froze. I just stared as he walked closer with a firearm now pointed at me. He told me to get off the floor and told me to get into the closet. He then asked me to sit down. I did what he was asking me, on my knees looking straight at him. I told him in a really shaken voice, my wallet and everything is on the bed and my keys are in the coat pocket on my dresser. He replied that he didn't care for my belongings and that he came for my life. Then he began to raise the weapon to my face. At this point I knew there was no tomorrow for me, or the next day, or any other day after that. I just closed my eyes to stop myself from looking at his pistol. There wasn't any fighting back either, because he was a little bit distanced from me, so I knew I would be killed immediately. So I just sat there in shock, life flashing before my eyes thinking about the last conversation I'd had with my mum, dad, and three siblings. I sat there with my eyes closed, thinking of all of this in the matter of seconds until I heard sirens outside. Hearing this, I opened my eyes, expecting the intruder to still be there, but no, no one at all. I still sat there frozen, thinking to myself, he's got to be lurking somewhere in the room, because I haven't heard any footsteps leave the room. I sat in the same spot until the cops came in, 
They asked if it was me who had called the operator, and I said yes. I felt relief knowing that I was just in real danger and seconds away from losing my life, yet I had not. The cop asked me if I heard the door or window shut before they came in, and I shook my head no, telling them that I was face to face with the man in my room seconds before they came in, and that I didn't hear anyone leave. They took my statement, and after checking the house, they came back to tell me there was no trace of a forced break-in or a broken glass or anything. Kind of shaken by the incident that took place in my room, I begin to get more weirded and more shaken. What the hell just happened, I asked myself. I know I heard the window break, which had awoken me from my sleep. After this part, there is kind of a blur, but I remember going downstairs and being in the living room. The cops had just left, and there was no way I was staying in the house after what had just happened. So I left not long after the cops did, leaving almost every light in the house on. I was horrified, but there was no way I hallucinated it. I asked myself if it could have been in my head, but I knew it wasn't. I remember going to my parents' house and taking a shower and getting ready for work at that point since it was now five leading into six and I had to be in at 6.30. I knew I was going to be late that day but told myself I would give them a good explanation. My house was nearly robbed. Only if that part alone was true, I wouldn't be telling them that. But I was so freaked out that I didn't bother to tell them the truth. But anyway, skip this part, fast forward two weeks later, and I'm still at my parents' house deciding if I want to go back or just call the lawyer and tell him it was nice having this first house, but I found something bigger and better. I was leaning more on moving out. During the whole week deciding period, I would go home to grab some of my essentials that I needed for work and stuff. I remember right before coming out, hearing a knock on the door. I was on my way out, so I approached the door and saw an older man who appeared to be in his late 40s. Hello, sir. Is there anything I can help you with? I ask. He introduced himself as Bennett and tells me he's my next door neighbor and hasn't had a good chance to introduce himself yet. He asked me if I was all right because he saw I had called the cops the other day. Yeah, it's just a misunderstanding. I kind of thought my house got broken into, which is what woke me up. Seemed it was just a hallucination or a trick, I said half chuckling while replying to him. Yeah he started saying. You know, there's something I wanted to tell you. It's about your home. Back in the late 60s, there was another guy who lived there. One day there was a late robbery around 3 to 4 a.m. He was in his room, which happened to be the same room as mine. When I guessed he heard broken glass, because the window was broken, assuming the intruder had broken in through that way. He called the cops, they came in a heartbeat, but right as they were walking in, they heard gunshots. When they went up to the man's room, they saw the intruder. He tried to have a standoff with the cops, but it ended up with him being shot twice and dying before the ambulance even got there. He said the man who was being robbed was shot twice by the invader, but was only hit in his chest and shoulder, and he survived. After hearing the story, it made me sick to my stomach. This told me everything I had witnessed that night and the day right after. I negotiated with my landlord to break lease early since I'd only lived there under a year and explained to him about the robbery and what had happened, but just the robbery part. The what I want to call paranormal was up to him and the next renter now. My parents had me when they were in their early 20s and they did not have their own place yet. When I was four, they got married and we moved into our own house, but before that, I lived with my mum and grandparents at her house. Since I was very young, I used to sleep in the master bedroom, in a big bed sandwich between my mum and grandma. My grandpa used to sleep in the spare room. I'm not sure why grandma slept with us. My grandparents had a great relationship, but anyway, I vividly remember an elderly woman with curly red hair and a green dress talking to me every night. She would appear after my mum turned off all the lights and told me to sleep. This lady used to tell me to be quiet and to not make too much noise because my grandma and mum were very tired and needed their sleep so that they could take care of me tomorrow. She was always nice to me. She kept me in check and made sure I didn't annoy my mum or nan or woke them up. 
Sometimes she would sing to me. I was always in my own little world when she was talking to me, like she demanded all of my attention. My mum confirms that I used to tell her that I saw the woman with red hair again last night. She was a bit freaked out, but she assumed it was my own imagination, and when I grew up and still visited my grandmother, I stopped seeing her. I lived with my grandma for a few months after my grandpa died, and nothing unusual happened. But at age 16, I was doing my A-levels, and one time my mum came with me to the A-level art to make sure I wouldn't get lost finding the school it was going to be held in. There was this other girl who had been in my secondary school doing the same exam, and her father had driven her there. My mum and her dad recognised each other and were doing small talk. She was asking him where they lived. He told her that he lived in the same village my grandma lives in, and my mum told him the specific block of flats as he lived nearby. He told her that people say they see a woman with curly red hair there, and paranormal stuff happens frequently. The description matched the one of the lady I used to see as a kid, and that really freaked me out for a long while. My mother did all her gynecology appointments with a doctor in downtown Austin. He was on the fifth floor of this hospital building and had a long-time nurse slash receptionist called Allison. I remember attending her appointments when I was little and being in the waiting room, which was colorfully decorated with a forest scene. Allison was a super sweet woman who was half babysitter for us kids too. She would read us books, give us coloring books, and occasionally even listen to our dreadful knock-knock jokes. We'd all refer to her as Alice in Wonderland. Anyway, years down the road, I got married and pregnant and started searching for an OB since I had moved back to Austin relatively recently before that. My mother suggested I go see if that doctor, who was super young, below 30s when I was born, was still in business. Well, I could not find his name in the hospital directory, so I figured I would just swing by the office and check. My mother happened to be in town as she had moved years ago and came with me. We both joked about being so familiar, but reverse situations now. As we reached the stairs, we ran into a problem. There was no fifth floor to the hospital office building. Hot. We both must have misremembered it. We knew it was on the top floor, so it must have been the fourth. Nope, not there. We thought perhaps we were in the wrong building, except we parked in the same parking garage from 20 years ago and walked the same route. That doctor does not exist. Never did, apparently. My mother and my brother and I are the only ones who remember him in Alice in Wonderland. We have asked around, including amongst the hospital staff. We even looked up our birth certificates, which are new copies, and just list attending physician. One of my childhood memories is fake, but somehow shared with my brother and mother. What the hell is going on? When I was around eight or nine, I was coming back from school with my grandmother. We were walking as my grandmother's house was a hundred meters from the school. In the road to the school, there was a ruined red house. From the broken windows, you could see damaged stuff, dust, garbage, and the like. The house had a weird atmosphere and my grandmother once told me that there was an old couple living there, but they passed away many years before I was even born. So that day, we were walking as usual to home from school, and I vividly remember how the door was open, and inside was old furniture, but not damaged. I mean, not any more a ruined house from the inside. At the doorstep, there was an old man, and by his side, an old woman, and they greeted us like long-term friends. I thought that was strange, as the description of my grandmother matched the two people there. Later in the afternoon, I went to my grandmother and asked her about who those people at the house were, and my grandmother said that she didn't remember seeing anyone. So I got out, went to the house, and it was, as always, ruined. No one inside. The house itself is now demolished, and the weird stuff is that my grandma doesn't remember anything about that. My grandmother wasn't even mentally ill or anything, and was barely 60 years old. So I don't know what the hell happened. My teacher thought it was only appropriate to tell us a story about his paranormal experiences. 
One of them that really stuck to me was a story he was telling us about his farm his family has always lived on. He said that eight years ago after class was over and he'd finished his tales, one of his students came up to him and asked how his grandfather died. He told Becky that it was kidney failure. Becky said that that's what she'd suspected. Then Becky started asking about the grandfather's appearance. Did he wear overalls, have really long gray hair and facial hair and wear glasses? At this point, the teacher is a bit creeped out and asks why she wants to know. Her response? Oh, because as you were telling the story about your grandpa, I saw him standing in the corner of the room. He wants you to call your grandma. This story happened to my friend's dad, and he isn't the guy to make stuff up, so I 100% believe him. My friend's dad, Jack, and his brother, Tom, lived with each other in the 80s. It was just the two of them living in the house and no one else. So this one night, Jack is coming home at night and walks into the living room to see a bunch of old people sitting around talking. As he walks in, they all quiet down and awkwardly look at him as he walks by. He doesn't see Tom anywhere, so he just assumes Tom will be back to tend to his guests. Jack has work the next morning, so he goes into his room to get some sleep, but is kept up from all the people talking. He walks out of the room and is promptly met up with Tom, who was coming out of his room to tell Jack to keep his friends quiet. However, Jack was coming out to tell Tom to keep his friends quiet. They walk out from the hallway into the living room, only to see it's empty, with the leftover smell of musk lingering in the air. We had a patient who informed me that her deceased husband was in there with us, literally there in the room, to take her home. I tried to gently tell her that there was nobody in there with us, but she insisted that her husband was there and that he'd be taking her home that afternoon after the kid's visit. Okay, fine, whatever. I brushed it off as dementia talk and figured that if she's happy in this delusion, I'm happy. But sure enough, her kids and grandkids come to visit, left, and she died very peacefully. Gives me shivers to this day. We also have a haunted room. We're only six beds, three on the left, three on the right, with a nurse's station right in the middle. I was at the station chatting with the nurses. This was very early on working there, so I was probably asking some kind of stupid question. Out of the corner of my left eye, I see this elderly gentleman walk into the last room. I took off running because no one should be ambulating without assistance. Only once I get to their room, it was empty and only then did I realize we didn't have any patients in that room to begin with. I walked back to the nurse's station to find everyone smiling and said, did anyone else see a patient out of bed? One of our nurses just chuckled and said, honey, you just met the spook. I've never seen him since, but everyone said it's a superstition around the hospice and that he only shows himself to people that he likes. And it meant I was formerly a part of the team now. When I was in college, my ex-boyfriend, who I was making moves towards getting back together with and still ran in the same social circles with, died suddenly. Apparently he was sick and I had no idea. No one knew a thing. Of all our mutual friends, a guy I barely knew was the one who called me and told me he was in a coma. Then later that night, I found out he died. His best friend came over to my apartment and announced the next day but did not bring it up until I finally couldn't hold it in anymore and said, So did you hear about? She said, Yeah, of course, and changed the subject. I was still completely shell-shocked. She seemed a little down, not like her lifelong best friend just dropped dead out of the blue the night before. I went to the funeral, and most of our friends weren't there. Nowhere near the number of people you'd expect at a healthy young man's funeral. Of who was there, no one seemed really upset but me. I know everyone grieves differently, but even his family weren't particularly dressed up or devastated. His younger sisters were giggling with each other the whole time. Weirdest of all was the people I spoke with. 
no one really seemed clear exactly on what sudden illness he died of. I'd like to have seen him one last time, but it was closed casket. I'm 99% sure he's really dead, but the circumstances surrounding it were so abrupt and strange that I sometimes wonder if he really faked everything to perfection. Just so you know, he really, really didn't want to get back together. You guys are about eight years late on that joke I made at the funeral. We dated seriously for several months. He dumped me, then several months later wanted to get back together. I said I wanted to think about it, and he died. The end. Now, he wasn't into drugs or gambling or anything like that. Not that I know of. He had a history of depression. I may consider getting a death certificate, although I may have trouble explaining that to my husband. A few friends and I share a really big old Victorian era house. During the first lockdown of the pandemic, I was the only housemate not working from home, meaning that in the mornings I'd be the only person up and about. One morning I walk downstairs and see the back door is wide open, and one of my other housemates is outside tidying up the garden. I saw him from the back, but I could be certain it was Andrew. I thought nothing of it, as he mentioned that he was returning to his office for a few days a week, as restrictions eased, and figured that it was why he was dressed quite smartly. White shirt, black trousers and shoes. Why he'd be tidying up the garden before he left for work, I will never know. But my housemates, being the people that they are, I was guessing he got drunk and trashed their place the night before, and perhaps felt guilty about it. I made myself a tea and turned to leave the kitchen, not really looking up, and noticed in my peripheral vision him pass the kitchen doorway down the hall. When I turned into the hallway, however, a second later, he was nowhere to be seen. A little strange, but it was early, so I thought nothing of it. The day continued and all was well. Later that night, when we were all hanging out, I asked Andrew about why he was tidying up the garden in the morning, and he hadn't a clue what I was talking about. He said to me that he had been into his office and didn't get up until long after I'd left. Then I mentioned that I saw him wearing a white shirt and smart trousers, and he freaked out a little bit, and confessed to me that he'd been keeping quiet about something he'd seen in the house, as he thought we'd take the piss out of him. According to him, he spotted a man exactly as I described standing in the living room as he passed by the door one night, but when he double-checked to see what he'd seen, the man was gone. Literally nothing else has happened in the house since. So, you know, maybe perhaps a bit of a boring story, but I finally have a ghost story to share, so that's nice. To understand this story, you're going to need a bit of information about me. I'm a 38-year-old man from Philadelphia. Growing up, I was a real loner. I had a few close acquaintances, but nothing more than that. When I was about 11, a family from Japan moved next door, and I became fast friends with their two daughters, Ayumi and Shoko. They were my closest friends on the planet. They even helped me get my first girlfriend. But things started to come to an abrupt end during our senior year of high school. They broke the news that they were moving back to Japan after they graduated. There was no stopping it either. After they left, and with no real direction, I enlisted in the military. Fast forward 13 years and I'm stationed in Korea. During one of the nights out, I'm enjoying the sights and sounds when I see a familiar face. And based on the unique way he was smoking his cigarette, I quickly knew it was their father. He was there on some business trip and we caught up and exchanged emails and he promised to tell the family I said hello and sent my regards. A few weeks later, he emailed me with a job offer in Japan and I jumped on it. I gave him my exit date from the military, and he got me a work visa. Things were looking up, reunited with my best friends again. But this is where the curveball comes in. Shoko picked me up from the airport in Tomaya, and she looked at me dead in the eyes. You remember my sister Ayumi, right? She asked. Emphatically, I replied, Yeah, you are both my only real friends. She turned pale and hung her head then told me she doesn't exist anymore.
confused and thinking perhaps her English was slipping after all these years of not using it. I asked, fearing she'd passed on. She said the following, and I can still remember it verbatim to this day. I don't know what happened, but one day I woke up and she was gone. No one seems to remember her either. She took me to the apartment her family had set up for me and made me promise not to say anything to her family. I reluctantly agreed based on how hard she was pleading. That night I called my family back in the US and I asked if they remembered anything about her and her family. They all remembered the family and Shoko, but not Ayumi. I had them send my things to me knowing I had photos of the three of us in my family gatherings and parties from family events. A few weeks go by and my things came. All the photos were of me and Shoko, not a single one with Ayumi. Now I fully understand what Shoko meant when she said she didn't exist. It was like she was wiped completely from the face of the earth. So I did what any rational person would have done and started freaking out. Me and Shoko being the only ones to remember her started researching things related like this. Over time we grew closer and eventually got married. We've been together three years now, still live in Japan, and every day we look into this further. If there is anyone out there who knows anything about this, or has any information that could be useful, you have no idea how greatly we would appreciate it. I had to take care of my mentally handicapped cousin a few years back. She could get around well enough, but due to severe arthritis in her knees and ankles, she had to be watched and helped into the bath and stuff like that. I would go into her room in the morning, help her to a walker so that she could wee and then make her breakfast. One morning I heard the water running in the bathroom and I went in to check on her. I had to pass her room on the way to the bathroom and when I did, I saw that she was in her rocking chair in the corner, her blanket over her head and she was rocking back and forth. Don't leave the water on, you're gonna flood the place. I went into the bathroom to shut the faucet off and my cousin was in there washing her face. I immediately ran back into the room, but it was just her blanket crumpled up on the rocking chair. My cousin wanted to know why I undid her bed. I didn't stay long after that. When I was little, maybe five, I would walk into my parents' bedroom to crawl into bed with them. Many times when walking into their room, I would see a young girl in a white dress standing at the foot of the bed. I would be paralyzed with fear, but being young, I didn't think I understood what I was seeing. I would take agonizing steps forward until I would crawl into bed and then cover myself completely in their blankets. She never moved, spoke, or acknowledged my presence. She was just there. I annoyed a ghost at my old job. I was told the carousel was haunted and didn't believe them. One night, the maintenance door was open and I emptied the ride of guests, and my second insisted they hadn't opened it. I closed it, loaded guests, and it was open again. It has a turn latch that you put a padlock on, so it could only have been opened intentionally. I went inside the center of the carousel, mostly just the breaker and all the mechanical parts are in there, and switched on the light to check for a maintenance guy that hadn't talked to me. It was empty. I'm a little spooked, so I say loudly, I'm not dealing with this crap tonight. I got an hour left to go, so get your act together, in my mum's voice. I do the safety check, start the ride, and the phone rings. When I answer, there's no one on the other end. A few minutes later, it happens again. And after I hang up, I call base to tell them something's wrong with the phone. The supervisor calls back and says sometimes the phone rings randomly and to not worry about it. I recount the tale to a co-worker and she looks at me funny. Did you turn the lights off before the music? No, I need the lights on to get the switch. Oh, well, make sure you never do that, and if the phone rings after, don't answer, just leave. I figure it's some kind of electrical shortage that causes it, and I go home. In the following days, I keep thinking I see it move out the corner of my eye, 
or hear it running after I've closed for the night, but shake it off. I was working 15 hour days continuously. The next time I open the carousel as we took turns, I go take a potty break and come back to the security guard standing next to my ride. I saw him while you were gone. Just be careful, he says to me. What are you talking about? The ride op, the one that tries to grab operators. I try and think which of my co-workers is that rude. He then goes on to explain that one of the three park ghosts is attached to the carousel and he is the only mean one and tries to grab operators and causes bad luck and rides to malfunction. Apparently I made him mad by yelling at him and he decided to haunt the hell out of me. I work on an adult oncology unit where unfortunately we have a lot of comfort care patients. The majority of them transition to hospice where they live out their final days. Sometimes they don't quite make it and they pass away while they're still in the hospital. We have the most deaths in the hospital on our unit and a lot of floats don't like coming up to the floor because everyone dies. We all love it though and wouldn't have it any other way. There's so much love between all the nurses and our patients and we get to know them really well. When people pass away, we have noticed that, not surprisingly, it comes in threes. We will go a few weeks with no one passing away. Everyone successfully makes it out of there and onto a hospice or to a TCU, wherever they choose to go to pass on. Only to have a week or two where we have three to six deaths a week. One week, we had two patients pass away in one night. One of the patients was still roommate. She was really near and dear to our hearts and it was a rough time for everyone involved. She had been on the floor for a prolonged period of time as we all watched her go from a spry old lady to basically wasting away in all aspects. She passed at night and by the next day there was a new patient in her room. It's hard on us all and we all know patients come and go and we have to move on. I was doing the admission with the new patient and going over room orientation stuff. I explained that she has a one-stop shop remote which controlled the lights, TV, radio and had the call light. Right as I finished explaining to her that the TV buttons are right here, I set the remote down on her bed and instantly the TV turned on by itself. It began flipping through each channel at an alarming rate faster than if you were just to hold down the channel up button. She was a little older and thankfully was not observant and thought I was doing it, but no one was touching it. She says, no thank you, I don't want the TV on right now. So I reached down and tried to turn it off. It didn't turn off and I ended up panicking a bit inside and yanked the remote out of the wall and telling her that it seemed not to be working properly and that I would get her a new one. The TV still wouldn't turn off after I unplugged the remote from the wall and normally it would be all connected and not working if it wasn't plugged in properly. I had to end up walk and manually shut off the TV. I head out of there telling her I'd be right back and as I went to the nurse's desk to grab another one, I ran into another nurse. She was grabbing another remote, which was odd. We just got a new shipment in and they were all normally working properly. We rarely had to replace them anymore. And I asked her if her remote was broken too. And she said that hers was acting up. I then asked her which room she was in. And it was another room that a patient had passed in the night before also. The TV remotes were uncharacteristically acting up from across the wing at the same time in the same rooms that people had died the night before. Freaky. I could ramble forever, but most stories are related to the TV. I had another situation similar to the one I just described, where the volume was going up and down by itself in a room where a patient had passed on recently. I've seen lights not work and then work again. I have even seen a sink turn on where there was no one else around. We have several designated rooms that are reserved for our comfort care patients and even when they are occupied, we will walk by them and it feels like someone's in there. But when we look, it's clearly empty. 
we have a room where IV pumps stop working and BP machines quit on us and nothing seems to work. But that room got cleansed by a healing touch volunteer, which I know sounds crazy, but since then everything in the room works fine. I've never been a huge believer in the paranormal or supernatural, but after working on this unit the past year, it's not hard to believe. We all just embrace it, because what can you really do? It was freshman year of high school, and I was at the first boy-girl party that anyone in my nerdy group of friends had thrown. I was obviously looking to impress the ladies and get out of my forever alone stage of life. So if I could find a way to do that, I was gonna take it. Lucky for me, a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to arm wrestle. I said, sure. And we went over to a ping pong table, set up in a corner and someone said go. I started to push and for just a second time slowed down. I realized that my arm was not moving forward like I thought it was going to. It was staying still. Suddenly there was a loud pop and my arm went limp at my side. It didn't really hurt, but I knew something was really wrong and I ran out of the room to collect my thoughts. I knew I had just broken my arm, but I had never broken a bone before and who ever heard of someone breaking their arm while arm wrestling in high school? So the next two weeks I operated under the assumption that I had pulled a muscle or something. My arm didn't hurt, but I couldn't lift it higher than 90 degrees. I was even in gym class at the time and played badminton underhand. Eventually my family realized it wasn't getting better. So after those two weeks, I went to the doctor who told me that unsurprisingly it was broken. Apparently I had a benign cyst in the marrow of my humerus bone. That meant my arm was very prone to breaking and the arm wrestling was just the straw that broke the camel's back. So now I go back to school and admit to everyone I had broken my arm wrestling the smallest girl in the freshman class. Not only that, but because of my cyst, I wasn't allowed to play any sports until my marrow filled back in. So I had to take another study hall instead of gym except I didn't take a study hall. I went to my school's TV studio and did the announcements that were videotaped and shown all over school. That meant that everyone got to see me in my sling and eventually everyone knew the story, just not the medical reason behind it. Sometimes the cysts will fill themselves in after a break, but that didn't happen for me. I had to go in for surgery to fill in my arm with some marrow from my hip and some synthetic marrow. A few weeks after the surgery, I noticed the scar I was left with was purple, swollen, and draining an orange, watery liquid out of it. I didn't let anyone know this for a while, but eventually I found out I had to go back to the hospital for two more surgeries to clean out the infected, pus-filled scar. So after all of that, my arm is now fine. I have a huge 1 by 3 inch scar on my arm and a 4 inch scar on my hip and a story that I got over being embarrassed about 10 years ago. I was finishing packing up the downstairs rooms. A little backstory. My mother-in-law can no longer live by herself and she came to live with us in February. Since then I have been going to her house to clear it and pack stuff up. First thing to know is that she's a hoarder. We have previously cleaned the house no less than four times. It's huge. We can fit four and a half of our houses in hers. It needs major repairs and remodeling. Then we are all moving in. So it's been stressful. I'm the one usually taking care of her house. However, in the garage, it's under the house, there's a little room and it gives me the biggest creeps. I had a previous experience where an entity picked up a cord and dangled it in front of me. Sort of saying like, hey, I'm here, you know, and I know. In the upstairs we hear bangs and knocks and you can feel someone watching you. This time I was finishing the last two rooms in the basement. They're furnished rooms and there's three of them. I finished putting things in boxes to donate and bagging garbage. These rooms lead to the garage. I had gone to put the donation boxes in the garage and got the biggest chill up the back of my neck. Now I have been in and out of there most of the day and nothing like this has ever happened. 
so I nope the hell out of there in the garage and close and lock the door. As I get out to the game room, I hear the doorbell, which doesn't work, and I ignore it because I want to get stuff done. Finally, I go to the room closest to the front door and look up to see who's there. There's no one except Don the Cat looking down at me. It's a stray because the windows are high up. I can see the door and the doorbell is still ringing. I walk to the last room that leads upstairs and I'm standing next to the doorway deciding my next move. When all of a sudden a white figure walks past me in the game room, it was a male. Just everything, a filmy white. It scared the peepoo out of me. It took me by surprise. It didn't feel evil, it just strolled on past. I don't think it was the garage thing. It had a different feel. I didn't leave, but I wonder what other spirit will show itself now. I did finish my work and left the boxes and baggy for the husband to deal with the... In college, I frequented a trail in the Appalachian Mountains near my college. Each time I would trek further and further, I never saw anyone on it, no matter how good the weather was. So, I just saw it as my own personal trail. For a while, I would walk to a large stream and turn back, since it was wide and deep, and I didn't want to get my boots soaking wet. One day, I was determined to cross the stream, so I moved several planks of sturdy dead tree to make a makeshift bridge. I crossed to the other side and everything felt subtly different. The air was different, the sky brighter, and surprisingly the trail on the other side was much better maintained than the part I'd come from. As I kept walking, I was noticing a lot of old soda cans lying around, the ones that are more perfectly cylindrical. I wasn't seeing any of the modern looking soda can designs. I passed an old cabin. It was occupied, so I didn't bother investigating and went along my way. I kept walking until I got to a wider, deeper stream. I wouldn't be able to make a bridge to cross that though, so I turned around and headed back. I distinctly remember the sky turning overcast within a few minutes. I couldn't clearly see the sky since the trees blocked a lot of my view. I had just assumed a cloud had passed across the sun, but when I got a better look, the sky was completely different. It felt like I was walking along a completely different trail. This is the craziest part. I looked over to where the cabin had been to find nothing but the remains of the cabin. All that was left was the stone chimney. I had walked by the cabin an hour back, but there weren't any ashes or any smoke. There was a thick layer of fallen leaves and even some litter, modern litter-like, beer bottles and cans with modern logos. I was dumbfounded and explored the cabin's remains for a good hour until it began to drizzle. I walked back along the trail. The old soda cans were gone. The bridge I had built was gone. I couldn't see the logs further downstream. The rest of the trail was just as I had remembered it. I walked the last mile or so of the trail in darkness and rain, guided by my phone, which never could get reception up in the mountains. So that's my weird time traveling story. I made a point of wanting to get back to my college town so that I could revisit the trail and see what's on the other side of the second big stream. If anyone lives nearby, I'd love to hear what you can find in the rest of the park loop. We joke about the little girl that lives in our house. My wife insists that she was a victim of a fire in the schoolhouse in the 1870s that was on our property before the house was built. We've never seen her, but there is the occasional door locked or unlocked or the errant attic light on and off and so forth. Not a presence that's very strong nor overbearing. This was one time though, when my wife was in the kitchen and I was coming down the stairs and we both heard, you're a good little girl, Dottie, coming from the living room. Dottie is our dog. Trouble, but a good girl to be sure. Apparently there's one more person in the house besides my wife and I who agrees. For context, we live in an ancient coastal New England town, halfway between the sites of the massacre of the Nagargarsets and the site of the Pequots. So although there are probably countless ghosts of native folks throughout our land, we are not apt to listen to them. The girl in our house is probably just one of the settlers in our town of one of their descendants. My mum thought she saw a ghost. 
She went outside around 10 p.m. for a sig years ago and saw a very elderly woman walking up to our neighbor's back stairs to their veranda. Mum says she wanted to ask if she was all right, as it was very rare for our neighbors to have visitors that late. They were also elderly, but Mum said she completely lost her voice and felt stunned, though she couldn't look away. She ended up getting out a hello, and the woman just disappeared. The next morning, Mum made a joke to our neighbors, asking why she wasn't invited over for their nightcap with their visitor, and they very casually replied, Oh, so you've seen our ghost too. They were excited over it, not remotely scared. Barry, the neighbor, says an elderly lady follows his wife, Elwyn, everywhere, and they feel pure comfort around her. But their own children and grandchildren are frightened by the lady on the stairs when they stay. The lady in 606 hated the TV on in her room. She lived there for years and would yell at roomies that turned their TV on. She would also fall asleep holding the button on her call bell to just annoy us. One day she dies in the middle of the night while I'm not there. And the nurse on duty at the other station reported the automatic front doors opening for no reason. It was later discovered that this was moments after her death there is a low census, so her room remains empty. Nursing assistants would frequently go into 606 and watch TV on their breaks. They reported that the TV would frequently turn off for no reason as they watched it. Her call bell would go off without anyone being in the room for months after her death. This was an old building with faulty wiring, but nonetheless, it was still very creepy. I was in the fourth grade when I was riding my scooter to my neighbor's house where my sister was. One house down from my destination, two pit bulls who were not leashed or fenced decided they were hungry. They attacked me and gave me wounds on both my arms and both my legs. My neighbor decided to come out to make sure I arrived safely, and thankfully she did, because when she saw me being attacked, her scream was loud enough to notify the owners of the dogs who came out and got them off me. A van pulled by and took me home, where my father tied some clean rags around my wounds and rushed me to the hospital. I ended up receiving more than 60 stitches and was incapacitated for the rest of summer, which sucked because it was the beginning of summer and I played Little League Baseball. It probably wasn't until senior year of high school that I got over the whole incident, but I remember it made me really emotional and frightened as a child afterwards. I'm 26 now, almost 27, and don't have a fear of dogs anymore, and can at least talk about it without getting emotional. The scars are always a nice conversation piece, especially in summer, when all of them are exposed by shorter clothing. I tell people not to be sorry for mentioning them, because I just don't care anymore. But dog owners, be careful with your dogs. This happened around four years ago in a house where I lived with my mum and brother. My mum and brother still live there. An old couple died in this house before we moved in. There is a small basement which me and my dad decorated so it's my extra room. The basement has a separate door from the outside. One day, I was chilling in the basement with my friend watching some movies. We were home alone. My mum was at work until 8 p.m. We told her to bring us some snacks, and when she returned, it was 8.15. When we heard the main door of the house opening and steps going from the living room to the kitchen and chairs moving, the normal noises you'll hear when someone is upstairs. We both heard it, and I was like, my mum came home. And he said, yeah, I hear it, snacks are here. A few minutes later, my phone rings. It's my mum, and I was like, okay, probably she's calling so that we can come and get the snacks. I answer, and she says, I'm stuck at work, probably be home at 10, problems of security. I was speechless. I looked at my friend and he was shaking. He heard my mum through the phone. I had one key to the house, my mum had the other. My brother was at my grandparents' place, no one else had a key and there were only two. So we went upstairs to the main door. It was locked. The lights were out. 
I opened and we searched the house. Nothing. That's weird. We just left it as it was. There were no chairs moved, even though we both heard them moving. And it still gives me chills even thinking about it. I heard a lot of steps and movement upstairs when I was alone in the basement, but didn't think much of it since only I heard it. But as my friend heard it too, I'm starting to think that everything else I heard was also true and not just a figment of my imagination. I'm a nurse and was walking down the hallway and going into the clean utility room to get a warm blanket. Someone was walking ahead of me about six to eight feet. I couldn't tell you anything about them or what they looked like, but I remember thinking it was a staff member. They opened the door to the clean utility, which requires a punching code, and it shuts before I got to it. Mildly annoyed that they didn't hold it open for me, I opened the door, but no one's in there. I thought it was weird, but didn't tell anyone about it or think much of it. Or later that night, a co-worker and I were talking about the shift and she said, Oh yeah, and now we have a ghost. I asked her what she meant, and she went on to explain my exact experience, only it had been told to her by another co-worker. Same hallway, same clean utility, the same general feeling of it being a staff member, but he couldn't tell you any descriptive details at all. It has since happened to three more people over the last year or so. I remember this like it was yesterday, because for me it was. It was July 22nd, 2011. I had just gotten married to my beautiful wife at the beginning of the month. I was 34 years old. Have you ever wrote your thoughts down knowing you're legally dead? Neither have I until now. Like I said, it was July 2011. I had only been married a few weeks. One day while my wife took a nap, I decided to take a walk. Right across from my house, across the street, is nothing but woods. According to Google Earth, the woods go on for a while. I may have been walking about half an hour to 45 minutes when I heard a noise. I'm not the kind of guy who believes in ghosts or Bigfoot, and I'm not worried about other people because I always have a knife or gun on me. I'm not scared easy. The noise I heard wasn't like a twig snapping, leaves crunching or rocks falling, it was more like a splash. So I followed the sound and it led me to a small clearing. I saw a creek, but the water wasn't clear like you normally see. Instead, it was a light greenish color. It had a glow and fog rose from it. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Only in horror or sci-fi movies, perhaps. As I was looking at the creek and all of its wonders, I heard the splash again. I followed the sound with my eyes and saw a downed tree. I saw part of a person's left hand. I immediately ran over and dropped to my knees to help this guy, and what I saw sticks with me to this day. As the guy raised his head in what I thought was to take a breath, he cut his eyes at me, halfway still in the water and a smile formed on his face. Just as fast as I saw him, he was gone and disappeared into the air, gone, no trace of him at all. Then, in what I'm guessing was about an hour, I woke up, I know you're thinking it must have all been a dream, but just wait. I was still in the same spot I fell asleep in. I jump up, still feeling a bit dazed and walk home. A million things were running through my mind, knowing my wife wasn't gonna believe what just happened to me. I knew I was gonna be in trouble. I finally made it home and tried to open the door, but my keys wouldn't work. Okay, that's weird, I thought. Suddenly a guy opens the door and asks, can I help you? Keep in mind I'd never seen this guy before. I asked him who he was and why he was in my house, where my wife was. Looking confused, he answered, Son, we've lived in this house for eight years. We moved in in 2011. Even more confused, I asked, What do you mean, 2011? My wife and I bought this house earlier this month. About this time, a woman walked up to him. I could only assume it was his wife and whispered something into his ear. About the same time, a cop was pulling into the driveway. I'm guessing that's what she was telling him, and that she had called the police. 
They took my wallet, knife and gun and placed it on the hood of the squad car. The police questioned me and the other guy separately, comparing our stories in just as such confusion as we'd had. The other guy gave the police all the proper paperwork to prove his side and was released to go back into his home. All the attention was then turned on me. I told them I wasn't crazy, to just look at my wallet. I told them I had my ID and to look at the serial number on my gun, neither would lie. They opened my wallet and laid everything out. There was nothing there but old newspaper clippings about nothing in particular, no ID. The serial number on the gun came back clean. It wasn't stolen, but there was also no name to the owner either. Frustrated, I told them to look. It had been a long day. You can just drive me to my father-in-law's house and he'll clear this up, I told them. The police officers looked at each other, then back at me and said, sure. And 15 minutes later, we were pulling into my father-in-law's driveway. A smile came across my face and I breathed a sigh of relief like a brick had just been taken off my chest. Everything was as I explained it to the officers, and soon everything was going to be okay. One of the officers knocked on my father-in-law's door to talk to him, and the other officer and I waited outside. A few minutes later, the officer and my father-in-law walked out to join us. My father-in-law looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, Sir, this officer just told me everything that's going on. I can't imagine what you're going through. I don't know how to tell you this, but I don't know you. I did have a daughter, but she died in a car accident four years ago. She'd never been married, nor had children. I don't know how you know these things about me, or what kind of sick game this is, but you need to leave. My heart sank. What in the world was going on? The officer apologized, thanked him for his time, and I asked where we were going to which they replied, the station, to try and figure this out. I begged them for one last try, to please call my dad. If anyone could make sense of this, it would be him. I gave him my dad's information, his name and number, the whole nine yards. They pulled over, called him and told him everything. I could hear my dad yelling. He definitely wasn't happy, and he too thought this was nothing but a sick joke. He screamed, I have no idea who this guy is or how he knows me. The only son I ever had, my ex miscarried over 30 years ago. I suffered with that loss daily, and this is just sick and twisted. There are a few choice words thrown in as well before he hung up on the officer. So I sit here now, as nothing more than John Doe. I'm not writing this thinking anyone will believe me, because no one else has. I'm writing in the hopes that the right person will hear this, and know who I am, and how it happened. What I'm about to tell you took place when I was 11 years old. I'm currently 48, but the memory never faded. At the time, my two older brothers shared a room together, and I shared not only a bedroom with my older sister, but the bed as well. I was the baby. One night, I awoke suddenly to the street lamp, red alarm clock, digits glaring at me in the eye. 2.58 a.m. As my eyes began to adjust to the darkened room, I noticed the pale blue moonlight streaming through the windows, landing across the foot of the bed. As I continued to survey the room, my eyes fully adjusted. Movement caught my attention. I quickly pulled my feet up to my legs as I felt someone sitting down towards the bottom of my side of the bed. I have a hard time believing what I saw that night even to this day, but here it goes. At the foot of my bed was this thing with legs, arms, and a body that would oddly shaped, distorted like, as if they were trying to transform into something else. The figure was dark, but not so dark that I couldn't make out its facial features, eyes or, should I say, where the eyes should be. There were two round, even darker holes, it felt as if I were looking into the depths of two deep wells. The nose was elongated and wide, with a pronounced hump at the centre of it. The mouth appeared to be nothing more than a slit. Even though I was focused on the basic nothingness of the face, I could tell the body was still shifting, still moving, as if trying to find a form. I tightly closed my eyes, 
hoping that what I was seeing was a mere trick of the light. But no, it was still there. I began gently kicking up my sister and quietly saying her name, scared that this thing at the end of my bed would hear me or see what I was doing. Then I heard it, a low guttural laugh. I could feel my body tense even more, fear rushing through my veins. I closed my eyes as tightly as I could again, but this time when I opened them, the thing had moved closer to me. It felt like my heart dropped deep within my stomach, and I immediately became nauseous. I could hear something coming from its direction, but I couldn't make out what it was. Again, I heard this thing begin to laugh, or more so giggling this time, as I shut my eyes out of pure terror from the sound, not realizing I had done so. I really wish I hadn't done that. I began kicking my sister much harder now and saying her name aloud. My eyes still shut tight. I could hear that sound again. It was closer now and resembled something of a low rumble or a hum. Terrified to open my eyes, and terrified not to, I decided to open them. What I saw will forever be imprinted in my brain. It was so close to me that I could reach out and touch it. The slip for a mouth was now trembling like an earthworm wiggling through the ground. I watched in horror as its hollow eyes grew rounder and began to take over its face. The trembling mouth, as well as beginning to grow larger, it was at this point that I finally realized what the sound was. The distorted body wasn't distorted at all. It was a horde of rats scurrying on top of each other, on top of that thing. The holes in its face were growing larger because the rats were running out of them. I can't tell you for how long I was frozen with sheer fright staring at it. I began to scream at some point, which finally woke up my sister as bright lights flooded the room. She stood in the doorway with her eyes wide, hand over heart, asking me what was wrong. It was gone. I began frantically looking, my eyes bouncing in all directions, but it had left. At this point, my sister was comforting me, soothing me with, shh, it'll be all right, sis. And I recall falling back asleep, holding on with a death grip to my sister's arm. I'm not sure why, but my sister chose not to ask me what frightened me so badly that night. The next morning brought sunshine and a Saturday morning, a favorite of every 11 year old. I immediately thought of the thing that had terrorized me the night before. And after giving it some thought, I decided that it must have been a very realistic nightmare. I walked out my bedroom and started down the hall towards the TV room. When I overheard my mom speaking to someone from her bedroom, as I drew closer, I realized she was on the telephone. What I heard sent a long, cold shiver down my spine. I think it was a demon. It stood in the corner of my bedroom, whispering that it was gonna take my children one by one, and it had rats running all over it. When I was 16, I had an elderly neighbor who used to go off to visit her son now and then who lived some miles away. One day in summer, we remarked to one another about my elderly neighbor's absence and was told this time she hadn't actually gone at all. We hadn't seen her for two weeks. We tried to get her attention via the doorbell, but it was no use. Being 16 and brave, I went round the back of the house and vaulted the garden wall. I positioned a bucket against the back window and climbed into it. Inside, I could see a winged black chair turned 30 degrees away from the window. I could see her long grey hair hanging down, and her left arm draped over the left armrest. I don't know what possessed me to do it at that point, but I jumped off the bucket and opened her kitchen door, at which point the smell hit me. My legs turned to jelly, and I walked through her tiny kitchen and into her lounge, where I saw her sitting as I had seen from the outside, clearly dead. The smell was, dear God unholy. She was about 10 feet away from me. I forced myself to look into her face. Her eyes were open and translucent. One appeared to have something seriously odd about it. Then it moved. The biggest spider 
I had ever seen had taken up residence within her vacant eyeball, and I ran all the way home. I am a nurse. My orientation tonight included all the spooky stories. There were two travel nurses that worked in L and D that decided to drive out of town to Vegas or Austin. Unfortunately, they had a really bad accident, and one of them died. The night she died, there was a loud scream heard through the hospital. It was so loud that the nurses checked room by room in multiple units to see where it came from. A day or two later. Everyone found out about the death. The time of the accident was the same time that everyone heard the scream. Another story was our ped's floor. We overflow there when P and P and L and D is full. Every department has the isolation room, which has the ante room separated by the solid door and then a door with a window. A patient reported to her nurse that there was a young girl who kept staring at them through the door window. She even entered and went to the bathroom to sit in the tub. Finally, the last story: doing stairs is a good way to get some exercise and keep you awake. We have seven floors, so not too bad. Unfortunately, sometimes you just get the bad feeling when using the stairs in the middle of the night. Sometimes it feels like someone is in the stairs with you. You could even occasionally hear noises, so stairs are avoided now at night. In that same vein, sometimes the elevator will stop on our floor and open if someone pressed the button, but there's no one inside, and no one pressed the button. My husband and I moved into a new house last year. Covid really did us dirty, and various less than ideal scenarios meant our savings took a huge hit. So we made the decision to move outside of the city. Cheaper rent, bigger space, a garden for the first time—all the good stuff. Since we moved in, there has been a really weird feeling, and I believe that, looking back, I have experienced a few odd things already. I have overlooked and tried to rationalise them away. The only thing I can't deny, though, happened earlier this week. I am still working from home while my husband is back in the office, so I am at home most of the day on my own. I have gotten used to this new routine over time, and honestly, I'm pretty happy with working at home and the peace and quiet. It allows me to get other things done around the house during my breaks, and cutting out the commute has been a godsend, especially now that we're outside the city. Because of this new routine, I've gotten used to having a new sixth sense around timings of the day, and when I can expect my husband to come home, usually around 7:30. The night this happened, I clocked off work early and decided to take a shower since it was hair wash day. Thick hair, friends, know how much prep this takes. My husband often comes home when I'm showering, and usually announces himself as to not scare me. For a bit of context, our house is super old. English terraced, which means it's long and thin and tall. When we moved in, the landlord had just renovated the bathroom that's located right at the top of the stairs, by adding a new freestanding shower on suite. Basically, if you're standing in the shower with the door open, you can look right down the stairs and down the hallway with a clear view of the front door. When I'm home alone, I often shower with the door open to mitigate the scare I will inevitably get when my husband comes home and bumbles up the stairs. When my husband gets home, he always announces himself as he comes through the front door. Usually, something along the lines of "It's just me." From the bathroom to the angle of the stairs means I can only see to the knees of whoever standing directly at the front door. My husband knows this and always bends down so that he can wave his hands up the stairs if he hears the shower. That is. So while I'm standing in the shower, listening to the rattle of keys in the front door. I become consciously aware that it's much too early for him to be home yet, since I'd clocked off work early and it was only 4:30. While I'm freaking out and staring wide-eyed down the stairs, my husband comes through the door. I see his feet, with his familiar grey suit and dress shoes. He announces himself in his distinctive deep voice and bends down to wave. I see his hand angled up, 
and a quick flash at the top of his blonde hair. Relief. He must be home early. Only he wasn't home early. After I relax, I look away to finish shampooing, and after about a minute later when I noticed that I'd never heard the front door close, and that I never heard the sound of his heavy feet on the wooden floor, or the loud thump of him dropping his work backpack on the floor before going into the kitchen. I peeked back down the stairs and everything was as I'd left it before showering. No bag, no work shoes, nothing. Everything was normal, except that my husband hadn't come home, despite the fact I'd seen him do it. Naturally, I freaked. Even though I checked the door and it was locked internally, I still went through the whole house with a kitchen knife in case, yet nothing was out of place. I sat on the sofa in silence for about two hours before he finally arrived home and went through his routine, the very routine that I'd already seen him do that evening. I never told him about this and the other goings on that I've remembered with the gift of hindsight. I know he wouldn't believe me. He's as skeptical as they come and I don't want him to freak out that I'm suddenly seeing things. My house has an open kitchen and living room. The front door is facing the kitchen. As I was walking in, I saw what I thought was my roommate's boyfriend ducking down behind the kitchen counter, doing something to spook me that didn't seem too unusual for him as he's a bit of a prankster. So I laughed and said something like, nice try, I saw you duck down. After a moment of silence, a super weird feeling washed over me and I quickly walked over the kitchen and passed the counter to see that no one was there. I walked down into the basement, and him and my roommate were down there watching a movie. The spot I saw this figure duck down was the furthest spot in the room from any door, so it wouldn't have been possible for him to duck down and then sneak out of the room, because he would have to go past the counter right to where I was standing to do so. This isn't the first spooky thing I've experienced in my house. Hearing glass shattering inside with no known source, stuff falling off walls, appliances acting weird. My husband has seen dark figures, but none of this was in our current home. This is the only house I lived in recently that I actually feel not creeped out in, like I can go out to the kitchen in the middle of the night for water and not even turn lights on. But I still often think of this person I saw ducking down to hide. I was 14 in the year 2007. It was the fourth semester of my grade nine year. I was so excited to finish the semester as I had a Christmas vacation to look forward to during the break. It was all I thought about. I didn't have much to look forward to in life at the time as I'm a very shy kid who didn't have many friends and my high school experience was only just beginning. So I didn't have many opportunities to engage with my peers in a meaningful way. So being the shy kid, I just fantasized about this vacation all day, every day. December finally comes, and it's time to go to Florida. My immediate family and I gathered all of our aunts, uncles, and cousins to take part in a huge drive from Windsor, Ontario to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where about 25 to 30 of my relatives rented a massive, and I mean massive, beach home to stay in for our week-long vacation. The drive was approximately two days long, and we stopped to sleep in between. But I didn't mind. I wanted to get there. I didn't care how long it took. We arrived at the house and the fun ensued immediately. We played games, watched movies, swam in the pool, joked and laughed. It was a great time. It was the week going into 2008 New Year. So that was just another thing to celebrate. My family is loud and rambunctious. So this energy was welcomed for my shy self. Now, this is where the thing happened. I was sharing a room with my younger cousin James. When he and I were not playing video games in our room late at night together, we would tell stories, talk about life, and get excited for the adventures to come on our vacation. We headed to bed this night and fell asleep just fine. But in the middle of the night, I wake up groggy, tired, and sort of confused. I heard my cousin James rustling around in his bed and get up in a hurry. I didn't think much of it besides how frantically he opened the door and ran into the hall. The hall light was on and everyone was awake. Weird, it wasn't New Year's or anything. It wasn't like he was running to see the ball drop. What was weird 
was that he was saying there was a huge noise coming from the entire house blaring on the smoke alarm. I didn't hear it at all, so this confused me. I get up and meet my sister Megan and my other cousin Catherine standing on the balcony worried and scared about the noise blaring through the whole house in the middle of the night. All of them were so scared, but I couldn't hear a sound. Not at all. I was standing next to my cousins and sisters asking what was going on, telling them I couldn't hear it. They looked shocked. I yelled down to my dad and uncles, who were shuffling in a panic trying to turn off the blaring sound, and I asked what's going on. Don't you hear the sound? No, I reply. I couldn't understand the commotion. I almost floated back to bed, like a listless walk without any life and curled back to sleep. Perhaps it was a dream. The next morning I asked everyone what happened, and they said, or well, the smoke alarm tripped up. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, that wasn't a dream. Surely it had to be a dream because the frightening panic that was felt by everyone being disturbed by the sound, and I didn't hear a thing, yet I was there, wasn't I? I asked my dad, and he said that I actually never was, that I never woke up from my sleep. He said I slept through the whole thing. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was there. I asked questions about the sound, I said. To this day, my family still claims, my entire family, that I was not awake during the ordeal when they were fumbling around to turn off the alarm. It still confuses me to this day, and I spent the rest of the trip in a confused state trying to put the pieces together. But I just couldn't. Did I actually sleep through it? But it felt so real. I remember getting up and asking what all the ruckus was about, asking my dad about the sound but no one said I was awake. Was I astral projecting? Was that why I couldn't hear the sound? Or was it a glitch? Perhaps I'll never know. The days when I used to play with the man in the closet. They go back to a time where everything was unclear, yet out of all the things to remember, that man has always been in my memories. Always has, and always will be. My first encounter with this man I remember clear as day. My family had just moved into a house in the States. It was my first time being in the States when I was five years old. And for some strange reason, I was excited more than anything. My little brother was running around the house. I called him and he came over to me. I asked him if he wanted to play a game and we decided to play hide and seek. And he went to hide while I counted to 20. When I got done counting, I went to look for him. I couldn't find him, so I started yelling, Raymond, where are you? I went to the very top of the house, the third floor, and I thought to look in the closet. He wasn't there, but I did find something. A door. There was a door inside the closet. For some reason, I thought to open it. I was only five and curiosity got the best of me. So I opened the door and inside it was nothing more than an empty room, except for a desk, a man and his typewriter. I walked up to him and asked, why are you in my house? He looked at me surprised as he couldn't believe I'd found this room. He just said, Jose, you're not supposed to be in here. I asked him who he was and his only response was, Jose, shouldn't you be looking for your brother? I bet he's worried about you. I looked at him and he looked back and I remember that he seemed quite average. Nothing about him was strange other than the fact that he was wearing all white. He held my hand and told me that I should keep looking for my brother. He opened the door and closed it behind me. I didn't think much of it as I was only five so I went looking for my brother and found him in the kitchen under the sink. I never told him about the man in the closet, mostly because I wanted the man in the closet to be my friend, not his. My little brother did not know about this man till I was about 12 and he 11. Anyway, that was the first time I met him, although it was not the last. I remember there were two other occasions. The second time I met him, I remember quite clearly. I remember it because my mother was fighting with my stepdad. I couldn't leave the house, so I hid inside the closet. Just so I wouldn't have to hear them, you see. 
My little brother was at my aunt's house, and my only guess is that they forgot I was in the house at all. It had been weeks, and I had tried to visit the man in the closet, but time after time I would look and the door wouldn't be there. But this time was different. This time he opened the door and I saw the light from the floor. He told me to get inside quick and I did. I have no idea how long I was in there for, and for some strange reason I trusted him. I never questioned how he knew my name without telling him. I never asked him for his. Maybe I did. Perhaps it's one of the few things I don't remember of him. The only somewhat personal thing I know about this man is that he was from Germany. After talking for what felt like hours, he told me it was fine to leave. He held my hand and opened the door. Everything's gonna be fine, Jose. It might look like it's always gonna be like this, but don't worry. Keep your chin up, okay? As soon as he led me out, he closed the door behind me. And when I looked back, the door was gone. I walked out of my closet, and it turns out I was in the closet for almost three hours, and my mother had been looking for me. I told her I'd been in the closet the whole time, but she said she'd already looked in there, and I wasn't. To this day, she still thinks I lied about it to her. Days passed by, and I tried to see him again. I went to the closet to see if he was there almost every day, from the day I saw him to the last. The door behind the closet just seemed to never show up anymore, until the very last day at the house when we were moving. My little brother was downstairs with my mother and I just wanted to check one last time. I told my mum that I'd be back. I'd left a toy in my room, and I went to my room and checked the closet. I saw the door behind the clothes in the closet, so I went to open it. And when I walked in, he was typing away on his typewriter. I asked him why he hadn't been around, and he just looked at me with a face that said, it hurts inside. I looked at him and said, I thought you were gonna be here for me. He kept looking right back at me with a face and just said, I'm sorry. He didn't have to say anything, but he did stand up and uttered a few words. It wasn't in English. In fact, if I really think about it, it probably was German. Then he held out his hand and walked me out the room. When I finally got out the closet, my mum had gone crazy looking for me. Turns out I was in that closet for a long time, at least two hours, and my mum was on the verge of calling the cops. I remember it clearly, like the other times, except this time was different. This time was the last time I saw him. The man in the closet, the man in all white. The man, for whatever reason, I could only see. I wish I could find out who he was. I still think about him every now and then, mostly because deep down in my heart, no matter how hard I try to deny it, I know this man was real. Even now, I just get goosebumps, because maybe he's still watching me. I think he knows I'm still here. That's what really gets to me. These all happened at the same house, which was an old farmhouse that was also a part of the Underground Railroad. We no longer live there. The house isn't there anymore. It's a very expensive neighborhood. My parents said they were sitting on the couch watching TV. The fireplace shutter opened and closed several times of its own accord, which scared them. On another occasion, my mum was sitting in the same living room. Towards her front was a large wooden deck that had a fireplace in the center and two large windows on either side. To the right was a concrete porch that ran the length of the side of the house. It had a door off the side that had several large windows on it as well. To her back was a bedroom that us kids shared in the winter because it was easier to heat half the house. To her left was the blue room. The whole thing was blue, but it was just a central room where our computer happened to be and had access to the basement. On the wooden deck, my mum saw a black figure. It was tall as a bear, but too thin to be human. She said she looked at it and had a feeling that it was watching her. It wasn't completely dark outside, but it was on its way. The figure then started doing laps around the house. It would pass the windows in front of her every few seconds. This was a 2,500-ish square foot farmhouse. It was incredibly fast. We had a small family farm chickens, goats, pigs,
quail, turkey, ducks, etc. Nothing big. We had about 30 chickens at the time. Living that far out in the country, we always set up traps by the coop to catch opossums and raccoons. Anything that ate chickens. Well, we go outside one day and see piles of feathers throughout the yard and around the coop. Every single pile had a head on top of it. 30-ish piles, and that many heads. No piles of blood, no insides anywhere. Just piles of feathers and heads. As you can imagine, that in particular we found quite disturbing. Shortly after this, my dad would go out at night with a shotgun to see if we could find anything. We had gotten more chickens and had nothing unusual in the traps, just cages. My dad was a manly man who wasn't afraid of anything. I've seen him move a tree by himself out the road that four grown men weren't able to together. He's tough to say the least. So he goes out like he usually does. Our chicken coop sits about 50-ish feet in front of our garage. It was really just an 1,000 square foot ranch outbuilding. We just called it the garage. So we hear five blasts from the shotgun very shortly after. My dad comes through the front door with tears running down his face. He is visibly shaking. After he calms down a bit, he explains that while in front of the garage, he heard a real guttural growl coming from the tree line right behind him above the garage. He says it wasn't like anything he heard before in his life, as he was an avid hunter growing up. He's heard and probably eaten just about any animal that Indiana has to offer. He said it was low and demonic, and he could feel that it was evil. So he immediately unloaded the shotgun for good measure and ran to the house. At another point, I would hear voices in the house. One night I woke up my parents crying to let them know that the devil wanted my soul and wouldn't stop trying to get me to give it to him. I don't remember much about it because I was in fifth grade. I'm 31 now and have since been diagnosed with general anxiety disorder. I can see that this might have just been my anxiety, but I definitely remember sitting on the living room floor and sobbing at 3 a.m., just begging for the voices to stop. I haven't heard anything else since, and nothing like this has ever happened to me again. There's also the time my parents found a tunnel in our basement that we assumed was part of the Underground Railroad. My cousin was over at the time and asked if we could explore it. It was covered up about shoulder height to an adult, and an adult could crawl through with not a whole lot of extra room. He had a flashlight and was gone for about a half hour. We started getting very worried when we would see the light again. He came back and said that there had not been an end in sight, but they were getting nervous having crawled so far. They were probably 16. We always had dogs and we would find our dogs in front of the house just dead. No wounds, prior symptoms, just dead. Sometimes three at a time. My dad, on his way home from work, saw a pile of dead dogs in our field by our house, probably about five feet tall. No joke. Have you ever seen a ton of freaking dogs? Unless a local vet with loads of dead dogs decided to just launch them into our field. How the hell did they get there? My two brothers and I were in the house, and things started to fall off the walls. We ran outside into the field in front of our house and looking across the street to the other cornfields, there were hundreds of deer just running. It filled the field for several minutes. Enough disruption caused by them made it look like we were experiencing a small earthquake. After we moved out, we found out that there was a practicing coven that met not far from our house, and we heard a lot of dead animal remains had been found. A decent amount of years later, I went with my sister to Chicago. Her fiancé had graduated boot camp and was going to A school. They do a ceremony thing for the family with their group flag and such. They hang out for a bit and then they leave for A school. On the way home, I was asleep in the car and my sister had gotten lost. I shut up out of sleeping and told my sister to pull over. She did and I told her to turn. She asked me what's wrong and I said that I woke up because we were by our old house, I could feel it. She made a turn, and we passed the front gates of a cemetery that was right by the house. 
Had she kept by that direction, she would have passed right by it. What was at the start of all of this was a dream that my sister had. I think we had some dogs die before this point, but we didn't find out about the coven until several years after we moved. I didn't find out about the dream until I was in high school. Surrounding the end of the property, there was a tree line that separated where the coven met and our house. My sister said that in her dream, there were monsters tearing down the tree line, and that she knew if they tore it down, they were coming for me. Like, me. Not my sister, or any other of the five people in my family. Me, specifically. But not long after, in preparation of turning the property into a subdivision, they tore down the tree line. All of the stuff happened. My parents decided one day that enough was enough. We were moving, and we had a house purchase on contract, and were completely moved out in two weeks' time. And now I bring you to the Pierre de Resistance. I was in Boy Scouts, and it was the time of year for popcorn. I sold enough popcorn to be the top in the state. That's what my parents told me, at least. I just knocked on doors and pushed the popcorn. My parents had just loaded up the van with all the popcorn we were going to deliver for the following morning. It was an old brown slash tan Astro van, the ones with the weird curtain in the windows. This thing was completely stuffed with popcorn. We all go to sleep, and I remember being outside with my family, looking at our van on fire. The fire department came and everything. The thing burned completely. While my dad had a Polaroid camera and took a picture, my dad takes the picture with him and shows people because it's crazy. My dad's showing a guy the picture and the dude asks him if he sees the face. My dad looks at the picture and sees a face. To summarize this because I don't want to make up details I don't remember, things started appearing in the picture, like in the flames. It started with a face that turned into a demonic looking Grim Reaper type of figure. Then people started to notice more things as my dad showed it to others. My dad would hand the picture around and ask people what they saw. Everyone saw it. Then people noticed that the figure was holding what appeared to be a chain attached to a torn apart dog and a burning cross behind it. As soon as people started seeing that, my dad stuffed the picture in a Bible. It was a Bible that had a built-in zipper and he didn't tell any of us about him stuffing it in a Bible until after we moved. He pulls out the Bible while we're moving and the picture is simply gone. He was really freaked out. I remember my dad always handling the picture with people and then being creeped out and I remember seeing the fire. I saw the picture once right after he'd taken it and I remember playing on the burnt up van because it was late in the 90s and we were kids. The rest of it is what my parents have talked about. My dad was a server at the same restaurant for about 25 years so he showed it to a ton of people. This wasn't just a few buddies. He literally began handing it out to customers. Everyone saw the same thing. This is everything I can remember. I tried to be as detailed as I could, and I'm aware that some of it isn't very believable, but it's true. The address of the house was 18401 SR 238 Fortville IN. I don't remember the zip code. The house is no longer there, and it's now a subdivision of houses that are 750k plus houses. They didn't end up tearing it down until after we'd been gone four to five years, but that's just a guess. This happened to my wife. We were asleep and it was 3 a.m. in the middle of summer, when she wakes up to banging on the metal screen door up front. She goes to check it out and it's a child, maybe nine. This kid is in some underwear banging on the door. My wife answers it and he asks if he can come in. Then some tweaker lady comes walking down the street and calls this kid's name, sees him, and calls him out. He just walks down the stairs and they keep walking down the street. She was really mad that I didn't wake up. I hope it wasn't a kid escaping from his kidnappers or some sort of abusive family. I'm a 19-year-old male, and I live in a small college town. I'm very exceptionally small for a guy. I look about 16 and am gay, have pink hair, piercings, and usually wear painted nails. These facts matter because I'm assuming it's the reason this happened to me, why this man even noticed.
Let me take you back. A few days ago, about seven in the morning, I was at the grocery store trying to avoid the crowds. You know, COVID. The store was mostly empty and I was just wandering up and down the aisles doing my shopping. While I was doing so, a man who appeared to be about the age of my dad walked up behind me. He grabbed me by the shoulder with one hand and by the butt in the other. I was wearing a slightly cropped shirt and a slightly small pair of shorts, which I maybe wouldn't have worn in a lot of places, but I felt like my town was safe, given it was mostly other college kids who were fairly progressive. I suppose the clothing choice may have been why I stood out as well. I guess I keep mentioning this because I partially blame myself, even though I know I shouldn't. Anyway, he grabbed me and I immediately jumped out of my skin, craned away from him as hard as I could and gave him what I assumed was a horrified look and rapidly scurried away. I actually left the grocery store and went straight to my car and decided I would go to another grocery store about a five minute drive away to do my shopping instead and felt more relaxed to do it there. When I step outside the doors of the grocery store though, my heart dropped to the pit of my stomach. The same creepy man from the previous grocery store who had grabbed me was waiting outside it. I immediately panicked and reached for my short pocket knife, which regrettably wasn't in my pocket. No one else was in the parking lot because it was still very early and the store had just opened. The man then came over approached me and said he was sorry to bother me and he didn't mean to offend me but he just wanted to tell me I was very attractive and was wondering if I could talk to him about it in his car. I said no in an extremely panicky voice. He attempted to reassure me so that I wouldn't be afraid. I was terrified he was going to kidnap me. In the time it took me to get my door unlocked, it was either the grocery store for help or my car. I was so filled with panic and felt so exposed and afraid that all of a sudden I just wanted to leave. So I decided to run for my car even if there was a risk. I ran around him because he was between me and the parking lot, running right by him. So close I was terrified he'd grab me, but he didn't. I ran as fast as I could, unlocked it as fast as I could, jumped inside and drove away. I drove around a while before going home, keeping an eye out if I could spot someone following me, but couldn't. After about an hour of driving around the town, trying to get rid of the bad feeling of being followed, I went home and locked myself in my apartment. I haven't felt too comfortable to go shopping alone without my boyfriend since, and haven't felt comfortable to wear shorts or crop tops outside the house either. Not that I should have to feel that way, but it is just how I feel now. Moral of the story for me was to never forget the knife at home, and if someone does anything weird like that, it might be a good idea to keep an eye out to make sure you aren't being followed. My parents' house has a ghost. When my sister, who's now 42, was five, she started talking about the green lady. Of course, us older three sisters made fun of her a lot. She continued for several years talking about the green lady. Then one day when I was 48 in middle school, I went upstairs and heard a swooshing sound. I turned to see what it was and there was this lady with a long green dress from like the 1800s and dark hair tied up very pretty. Then just like that she was gone. I never saw her again after that. But my mum took in a little boy for a while for a family that needed us when I was in high school and he always talked to a lady upstairs when he was alone. He was only three when he stayed with us. Also, lots of weird things happened in my parents' house. Cupboards would open and shut on their own, and the water faucets would turn on and off by themselves. I don't know the history of our house before it was built, but it would have been newly claimed land in the 1800s. Not to mention the fact that my sister, when she was five or six, shared a bedroom with me. She would wake up screaming, saying there was a dark man in our closet. My parents would have to come in to calm her down. I never saw that, but she saw the dark figure. She was petrified of the dark figure, but perfectly fine with the green lady. I don't tell this story often, because at 48 it still sends chills down my spine. I often wonder if the dark figure in the closet isn't responsible for the death 
of the Green Lady. My facility is fairly new, but has plenty of quirks. 95% of the paranormal or creepy things are just normal part of the building's function. The other 5% though, have no explanation that I've been able to find in our four years of employment, and no one in maintenance or exhibits can give a good answer for either, and they've tried. It was built in a formerly economically depressed part of the city before the area was gentrified, and some of that shows through in the weirdest ways. So occasionally we get this weird cloud of odor that just pops up and sticks around for a bit and then leaves. It could be anywhere in the building at any time and lasts for any length of time. And it smells like weed, strong weed. I thought someone had dumped their stash next to an intake vent at first, but the first time I knew something was up, I was working second shift with a coworker at about 10.30 at night. He's on a catwalk about 80 feet above the ground and reports a smell like someone smoking had just walked past him. We followed the smell for two hours before it vanished. What we determined was this, a sphere odor about 2.5 to 3 feet in diameter, hovering about 5 feet in the air was moving back and forth across the catwalk at a leisurely walking pace, not like air currents. It was like a dude was pacing casually on a smoke break for two hours. We chalked it up to a ghost and left and went about our night. 14 months later, I was working alone in our command center at 4 a.m. It was the dead of night, raining outside, and there had been no one around the building since midnight. In the span of about six to seven seconds, the air went from normal office smell to hot boxing with a hippie for three days smell. It was so strong that it made me gag, and I was legit worried about catching a high contact off it. After two minutes of me checking cameras and videos around, any intake vents, it just disappeared. Not like the air ducts were cleaned out, or like a filter started working again, just like it showed up three or four seconds between me noticing it, and was letting up, and it was totally gone. Like it had never been there. It happened a few times since then, but these are the most memorable events. When I was around 13 or 14, I had a dream that me and my mum were in Holland in a hotel to see my stepdad's daughter. And when they were checking into the hotel, I saw my mum, but in the dream I couldn't see my stepdad John. I mean from the back it looked like him, but when he turned around there was someone else there when I woke up. A few weeks later, me, my mum and my stepdad John went to Holland to see his two daughters. So we checked into the hotel, Bearing in mind I told no one about the dream because I didn't want to people think I was crazy. So we were checking into the hotel and there I was standing. I saw everyone. It was exactly the same as my dream. I thought I saw John my stepdad but it wasn't him. And when the guy turned around it was the same man from the dream. I got the biggest chills and it was the most surreal feeling of my life. Me and my friend were at a Chinese restaurant. We ordered a general so chicken and a shrimp lo mein. When we sat down, we took out our boxes and set them on the table about two feet apart. My friend opened the first box and sees a shrimp lo mein dish. It had all the things in there, noodles, shrimp, fried rice. He closes it and opens the other box. Inside is another shrimp lo mein dish, shrimp, noodles, fried rice. Oh, I think they must have mixed the order. I was just about to say this when my friend says out loud, Look, they made a mistake and gave us two. He opens the first box again. Inside is a general so chicken dinner order. White rice, egg roll. He froze and looked at me, and I looked back at him. We sat there in silence. It took us five minutes or so to collect ourselves. Neither of us have any idea how the hell that happened. I was sitting in my living room watching TV and my mum walks by, and I say, hey, and she just walked into her room. A few minutes later, she walks through the front door with groceries, as she had just gotten home from the store. Someone please tell me what the hell just happened. There's no way my mum 
was there one second and arrived later. I just can't get my head around it. I work in long-term care and we have tons of stories. I'll give you two of my favorite ones. We had a woman in our assisted living unit. She was a very sweet lady with dementia who could never understand how to use her call light for assistance. So every night she would meander over to her neighbor's apartment and ask him to get someone to help her get ready for bed. He would then put on his call light and tell whomever came that the lady needed help. The man is still with us and he has no cognitive deficits or memory problems. He's here because of severe kidney issues and can't manage all of his tubes and medication. The lady became ill with pancreas issues and stopped knocking on the man's door for about a month. She sadly passed away one evening at 4 p.m. And at approximately seven that night, while the family was still in the lady's room with her, the man put on his call light and said that the lady was ready for bed. Creepy, right? The CNA figured he was just picking up an old routine. So she asked him, she came here? He went on to explain that she must have snuck in the door because he didn't hear her knock. She was wearing a white robe and holding her rosary beads. The CNA told me all of this and I being a huge skeptic didn't believe it. He must have been dreaming. The family finally left and when the funeral home director arrived to take the body, I went out with him to help move her onto the cart. We walk into the room and there she was laying in bed, white gown, rosary beads in hand. The neighbor still occasionally puts on his light for her. A second story. The building I work in sits on the same site as the old nursing home in town. It was bought out by a nonprofit, torn down and rebuilt into the building I work in now. The old building had a very friendly lady that worked in the kitchen as a cook. She worked there until she retired and a few years later she had a stroke and came to live in the new building. She had vascular dementia pretty badly and would find her way into the kitchen all the time. We had to guide her back to her room. She died about a year ago. Ever since she passed, strange things would happen in this kitchen. You can hear fridge doors open and slam closed. You can hear water running and things falling. I've watched the light turn on and off and there were always cold spots in the kitchen in different spots every night. One night took the cake though. A CNA was in the kitchen getting chips to stop when she said the walk-in freezer door came open and she watched a dark smoke-like outline walk out stop, turn to her, wave and disappear. She didn't go back into the kitchen after that. I offered her a hundred bucks once and she point blank refused. Bonus story. My wife was pregnant and we had our C-section scheduled early because she has polyhydrominos and our son was measuring 11 pounds and 36 weeks. Holy huge alien baby. He was only born 10 pounds though. The hospital we decided on was only two blocks away from our house, but very old and very institutional looking. The OB unit was one very long hallway with rooms on either side and a nurse's station in the middle. Our son was born and we spent the next three days in the unit. Where we came up to the unit, we noticed another couple was in one of the birthing suites at the opposite end of the hallway from us. We heard that babies crying every day at completely appropriate intervals for the duration of our stay. It would cry for three to four minutes every one to two hours like clockwork. When we were being discharged home, we asked the nurse if the other couple on the unit had a boy or girl. The nurse gave us a puzzled look and told us that we were the only couple on the unit. The other couple was discharged before our son was born. We're going to another hospital if we have another child. Okay, another bonus. My wife has had two miscarriages since our son was born. This last Christmas day, we took our son to the site of the cemetery where the unborn babies are buried. 
It had just snowed the night before, so the whole ground was covered with fresh snow. We couldn't even drive into the cemetery yet because it hadn't been plowed, so we parked on the road. This is a very rural cemetery with maybe a hundred plots. When we walked into the cemetery, there was a single set of very small footprints, a child's for sure, that led through the gate and weaved through the gravestones directly to the spot where our babies were buried and stopped. The prints did not turn around or go back or lead anywhere else in the cemetery. They simply walked to that burial spot and stopped. The second we got to the spot that our babies are buried at, it started to snow the biggest, most beautiful snowflakes I've ever seen. We said a little prayer, my wife cried a little, and we walked back to the truck. It stopped snowing again by the time we got back to the truck. Crazy. In order to tell you this story, I have to go back many years before it. My grandma bought a house in Salt Lake City in a suburb in the 1960s, after her and my grandpa had their first child together, and she believes the home had been haunted since day one. She says that even though it was clear early on that something was in the house, she never felt that she needed to leave. She said it was her home now, and that whoever was there was welcome to stay as long as they understood and appreciated the rules. Other than one story, it appears that all ghostly residents at Grandma's house followed the rules and never gave her a reason to evict them. Over the years, Grandma welcomed more children to the home and it became a safe haven for my entire family. The home is a one-story home with a downstairs living area. The upstairs has a living room, bathroom, and two bedrooms. The kitchen leads to a set of stairs leading to the basement with three or four rooms. We use the home for most family gatherings, and many of us have used it as a temporary residence once or twice. Much of the family has experienced something unusual in the home, and it's commonly blamed on the ghosts. Two of my grandma's stories are the reason that I have one of my own. My grandpa died in 1999. Several months after his death, my grandma was in her kitchen doing the dishes. She felt a strange feeling come over her like she needed to leave the house. She later attributed the feeling to my grandpa warning her of danger. Before she could even finish her thought, she had a sensation that something very strong was grabbing her from behind and trying to force her downstairs. She couldn't see anyone, but she felt something powerful try to force her. She states she fought the power very hard and managed to make it to her kitchen table. She sat at the table and held onto it, while this violent entity pulled and groped her, but she would not let go. Finally, it stopped and no one was there. The house was again silent and peaceful. She said she'd never been so scared in all her life. My grandma is a tough old lady, but you could tell this really shook her deeply. While telling me this story at the same kitchen table, she told me of a little ghost girl that lives in her basement, or she may not. She said the little girl likes to play pranks on people, like pulling the blankets off while people are sleeping or hiding things in the house. Grandma says she knew it was the girl because of the laughter. She would giggle mischievously so she knew it was her. She seemed peaceful and like she just wanted someone to play with. One day my mom was doing laundry downstairs while she was living there during her separation from my dad and she says that she saw what appeared to be the hazy outline of a tiny person. She says that she said hello with a nervous laugh, and then the haze disappeared. To this point, I had never experienced anything scary or ghostly in the home. After hearing the stories, I was creeped out being in any room alone, but still nothing more than a spooky feeling and an embarrassing sprint up the stairs every time it happened. Again to that point now, flash forward a few years to the exact same kitchen table, only subtract my grandma and add my mother and two of my friends, Brad and Ashley. We're all sitting around talking and planning out our evening. My friends and I had no money, so we settled into an evening at grandma's house with my mom. Not exactly my idea of fun. At one point we began telling ghost stories and my mom and I decided to tell my friends about the house of horrors that we were currently sitting in. My mum told me about the little girl. She too had an experience with her, so it made sense for my mum to tell it. 
the girl's story was met with enjoying but disbelieving eyes. So when it was my turn to tell about grandma's dishes incident with the little girl, I was not surprised to see the same reaction on my friends' faces. The I call BS look. Next, as if almost on cue, the cheap yet expensive looking chandelier that hung above my grandma's table exploded. I'm not talking about a blown bulb. I'm talking about four light bulbs actually exploding. Glass went everywhere. After a few moments of looking around at each other, we all decided we needed to leave. After tripping all over each other in an attempt to save ourselves, we managed to make it outside safely. We all left the house within minutes. My mum went home and my friends and I got intoxicated. The ghostly pyrotechnics were of course the talk of the evening. Even now I recall this as being the most spooked out I've ever been, as we discussed what happened with some other friends we met up with that night. I began to notice that familiar BS look on their faces, but needless to say, Brad and Ashley believed. So I had this patient, mid-thirties, female, perfectly healthy. We get chatting and I learn a little bit about her. She had just moved in with her fiancé. According to this fiancé, their new house was 100% movie haunted. Stuff being moved and missing, doors slamming shut, strange sounds at night, the works. He came home one day from work and found her crying in front of the bathroom mirror. He asked her why she was so upset, and she said she couldn't remember, just that she felt tired and wanted to go to bed. When she woke up, she said she couldn't breathe, so he took her to the ER. One emergency surgery, an ICU stay later, I transfer her to telemetry. Well, when we transferred her to the floor, the first thing she did was ask them to cover up the mirror. The way their rooms are set up, is that the bed is on one end, and at the opposite end of the bed is the dresser slash sink slash mirror. If you sat up straight in bed, you could see yourself in the mirror, and it makes a lot of patients uncomfortable and is not that uncommon of a request. So we happily taped a bed sheet up and left. The story goes that one morning, the tech bathed her and got her up into the chair. They do baths very early in the morning, so the patient must have fallen asleep in the recliner. The tech left to get extra sheets to cover the mirror, but got distracted and forgot all about leaving the woman in the room alone with the uncovered mirror. Well, the call bell goes off a little while later, and after realizing her slip, the tech goes to grab a sheet. When she entered the room, she found to her horror that the woman was dead on the floor with her test tube ripped out. I think I was around 16-ish, and I was hanging out at a friend's house. It was normal for me to be over there hanging out, even if my friend and I weren't actually hanging out together. So I was wandering around the back of their house, and I found a little door behind a set of hedges. Not like a tiny fairy door, but like a cruel space access square door. The funny thing was, it was not at ground level, but about three feet off the ground. I had been in this backyard before and been all over this house and the door should not be there. If I went in, it would open up in the brick wall of the garage that had been converted into a small workshop room and there was no door from the inside. But being a curious girl, I pried the door open and looked in. It was a dark and sealed up room. The floor, which looked like it was dirt, but there were a few pieces of furniture inside against the far wall, which was the front of the house a table slash workbench which was set up with two chairs neatly tucked under it. And I also remembered a dresser or an armory turned around so the drawers faced the wall. There was also some cardboard boxes and odds and ends scattered around, but everything had years of dust coating it. So with it being dark as coal, it was hard to tell what was what, but there was something written on the wall above the workbench. It was two words, and I'm certain the first word was jacket, and the second word was something that looked like free. I reached inside and felt for a light switch, but couldn't feel one, although I did see a bare bulb hanging down. I noticed my hands were covered in dust from the wall. 
I thought about it and considered not crawling inside as I liked a flashlight and wanted to tell someone so they could help me in. I left the door open and ran back inside to get my friend. He didn't believe me, but he still followed me outside. When we got to the backyard, I peeled back the hedge and it was gone. The door just simply wasn't there anymore and I knew exactly where it had been, but it refused to re-exist for me. My friend wandered back inside and while I ran around the house a few more times looking everywhere for the damn portal, it never reappeared. But my hand still had the dust on it from reaching inside for the switch. But it was not the dirt that was outside. It was clearly different dust. I have no idea what I saw, but I'm glad I did not crawl inside now, as at the time it wasn't scary. But now, thinking back on it, it's terrifying to think about. About a month ago, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I took a high walk to the local McDonald's. I had almost reached the restaurant when I suddenly felt a bug zoom into my left ear hole. In panic, I stuck my index finger into my ear trying to grab the bug. Unfortunately, I think it just pushed it in further. I walked into the McDonald's bathroom and looked into the mirror, but I couldn't see the bug in my ear at all. I could feel it though and needless to say, I was thoroughly distressed with this point. I found the fortitude to complete my McDonald's mission, ordered four McDoubles, two McChickens and a large fry, and while waiting for my food, I called my mum and asked her for advice. She told me to shake my head and let gravity do the work. So there I was standing in the McDonald's, sweating and jerking my head from side to side, looking a little bit schizophrenic or like a crackhead. This did not work. If anything, it made the matters worse because it agitated the bug. I could feel slash hear it moving inside and it was terrifying. Whatever it was moved on its legs and I could hear a loud rustling and there was a pain and pressure in my left ear canal that has since gone unmatched. After getting my food, I hurried back to my friend's apartment. I told them about my plight. Most of them were stoned and just laughed it off. It's not a big deal, bro. It will come out eventually. My friend Max looked up what to do with a bug in your ear. We tried the first solution, which involved turning off all the lights in the room and shining a bright light near my ear. But that proved ineffective. About an hour later, the bug was still very much alive and very much still in my ear. Every time it moved and I heard the rustling, I would twitch involuntarily. I finally gave in and agreed to try the second method the internet suggested, pouring oil down the ear canal to try and flush it out. I took a knee on the kitchen linoleum and let Irene pour a little olive oil in my ear. When the olive oil went in, the bug began squirming like never before, I think because it was drowning. This combined with the discomfort of oil draining into my ear was about all I could bear. I let the oil flow down with my head cocked to the side for about 10 seconds, bellowing in agony for a while, then stood up and tilted my head back to the left, and the bug finally flowed out. The feeling of relief that washed over me at that moment was indescribable. It almost made this whole ordeal worth it. My friends were shocked to see the bug, a sizable black beetle with a hard exoskeleton. I don't have a picture, regrettably but I'm so glad it didn't lay eggs in there or cause damage to my ear. It is by far the scariest thing that has ever happened to me in my life, by far. I was very young, probably only four at the time. My family were visiting relatives in a house they were staying in temporarily. My mother tells me the whole thing seemed very off from the get-go. The house was pretty old, Though I'm not sure how old, and my grandparents must have been sensing something there from the start based on their reactions, but I'll get to that in a while. Anyway, my brothers and I were playing in the living room of the house, and apparently both my brother and I separately went to my mother and asked her about the man in the window. I vaguely remember seeing the outline of a man's shadow against the window, but I don't remember any details. I wish my memory were better, but hey, I was four. My brother was asking, why aren't we talking to him? To give a bit of context, our family is massive. 
We have tons of extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles, etc. So it was not uncommon for us kids to meet complete strangers at family gatherings, which is why my brothers and I were not terrified of said strange man. My mother looked in the living room and saw no one and asked my brother where the man was. Over there against the wall by the window, he replied, and pointed to an area where the man was. At this point, my mother was confused and my grandmother overheard the conversation and came over to us. What is it? She asked. And my mother explained what we were saying about the man. She immediately got a bottle of anointing oil when we went through the entire house, praying and putting oil above every doorway. My grandfather was previously the pastor of a Methodist church, so it was a reflex action that anything even remotely like a ghost or demon had to go. I should mention here that supposedly, and I say this because I don't know if I believe it or not, the bottle of oil my grandmother has is special because, get this, it's empty. Yes, she keeps a small empty glass bottle in her purse and apparently whenever she needs to anoint something or someone, there will be oil in it. I don't know if I believe this or not, but I digress. After the house was prayed over by them, I believe we had group prayer and we couldn't see the man anymore. Honestly, I wish my memory from the experience were better so I could describe him to you all. However, since it was not a traumatic experience or even something my mind could comprehend at the time, I don't remember much at all. Most of the details are from what my mother told me years later. I'm not one that believes in ghosts, but some of these stories I've heard about haunted rooms and units come from reliable sources, and once from my own. When I was a nurse assistant, we had 73 on the ortho floor that was haunted by a small child. On numerous occasions, patients in this room would hit the call light and ask us to get these kids out my room. One night a patient called out and asked me to shut his door because there were kids laughing in the hallway. It was the middle of the night and no kids were on the floor. I just apologized and shut the door. 10 minutes later, he calls and asks us to get the little girl in his room out because she was at the foot of his bed. I went in there and he said that she was gone, but that she'd been staring at him. These things happened several times over my three years working there. The second story I never actually witnessed, but has actual interactions with ghosts and spirits slash patients. I was working at the hospital in the south that has two ICUs. The one on the third floor was basically an overflow where the main unit got full but had eight beds in it. Supposedly a nurse that had worked in the hospital a long time ago had died in room two. Kind of a catty corner, the desk and difficult to actually see in while sitting at the desk. One night a nurse was chatting and out of the corner of her eye, she saw another nurse walk into that room. She got curious after a few minutes because the room was empty and she assumed someone went in there and got cords or something. She gets up and goes in, but there's no one in the room. In the same room, a nurse went in early in the morning to do some dressing changes on a patient. The patient was AO times four and completely with it, but was confused as to why the nurse was doing dressing changes. The patient stated, there was another nurse in here 10 minutes ago that changed my dressing. Thinking it was the other nurse in the unit that night as there were only two, she went ahead and thanked the other nurse. The other nurse said she hadn't changed any dressings and had been doing something with her patient for several minutes. Other smaller stories happened, but they always took place in room two when there were only two nurses working that. You. I was working on a research project during college to determine the residual feed intake for a group of heifers from a massive farm in Georgia. I was just hired help, so I didn't do much with the data. My job was to sort heifers into the sweep tub, which is basically a big gate that we use to push cattle into a chute. One animal at a time, so they can be treated for disease and injuries, or just to be weighed. Every two weeks, 
we'd weigh these heifers, and I would sort our groups of four to five out of twelve to go into the sweep tub, close the gate behind them, and get them to go into the chute. One day, about a week before Valentine, I was running the sweep tub again, and had to get a heifer out of the corner and into the sweep. She decided to do a 180, and the next thing I know, the head of an 800-pound animal is hitting me in the chest. My ass is pinned against the gate, and her hood is coming down right on my crotch. After making a male nurse uncomfortable with my story, the doctor said I was lucky, because the wound was in the best place possible. The only downside was that I wouldn't be able to celebrate Valentine's Day the fun way. Basically, a heifer almost made me a eunuch. I was probably about 20 years old, in Vancouver, British Columbia. It was a Sunday, and I'd just met this girl I had a super crush on at a coffee shop. We had a nice visit, and I wanted to ask her out, but I chickened out. Vancouver is a pretty busy city if you've not been there, but this day it was oddly quiet. I was walking down the street. I was at the light, waiting to cross the road. The light changed, and the little red hand turned into the you're safe to cross, guy. At that point, I had some severe mental confusion that I'd never had before. It stopped me dead in my tracks. I had this weird little debate with myself. So in my mind, I said, should I walk? I think so. The little man is walking, which means I'm safe, right? I mean, it was the hand, which means stop. And then it was not the walking guy. So does that mean I can go? I was dumbfounded. Then I debated to myself the red and green aspect and said to myself, the light was red but is now green. Green means go and the little man is going, so I should be able to go, right? Now, I am not a rule follower type and there was almost no traffic, so I would have never had this insane debate with myself. I would have simply looked both ways and crossed the street, but instead I had this weird internal confusion. I took one step into the intersection and a suburban ran the red light and sped through the intersection. It was like they were being chased by cops, but there was no one. I would have been right in front of that car. Had it not been for the confusion by the lights, I'd have been 100% dead. The last story is uh, something I swear is true. Maybe there's some other explanations. I'll let you decide. I used to deliver candy to vending machines as a job. I was on Vancouver Island, and basically, there is only one road that connects most of it. I was coming from Victoria and going up island. I was coming up the summit of the road and just short of cresting the hill when I heard this massive bang. It was the loudest bang I'd ever heard in my life and then there was this massive cloud of dust in front of me. I naturally slowed down to a crawl. Then the dust was moving in this weird pattern and the cloud directly in front of my vehicle was being blown across the road. It's hard to explain but imagine a 50-foot wall of thick dust in front of you, and then the bottom 10 feet of the wall being blown across the road in front of you, while the other 40 were just kind of hanging across the air. Anyway, I was just coasting slowly, and kind of driving up to where the clouds were blowing, and another voice in my head that wasn't mine said, pretty damn loudly as well, shut off your engine and roll through the cloud. I almost pissed my pants. I was so shocked, but I did what the voice said, I shut it off and put it in neutral and rolled through the cloud on the other side. So what happened was a propane delivery tank had plowed into the mountainside. We found later the driver was drunk. The top of the tank, the safety valve, had been blown off and it was propane that was blowing the dust across the road. I think the voice in my head was getting me to shut off my engine to stop anything from igniting the propane, which obviously would have ended super badly. I didn't smell any of that propane stank, but someone later told me the sulfur scent is added later so that people can tell there's a gas leak. The whole road was shut down for a day or two after that. Anyway, to me, this was 100% real in each instance. I do not normally hear voices in my head. I have no doubt in each of these situations I could have died. So on one hand, I feel like my life has been saved repeatedly for some reason. But on the other hand, I'm just some jerk who's not really doing anything useful with my life to warrant such intervention. But who knows? 
Maybe one day I'll save the world. Here's to hoping. And thanks for listening. I used to work at a soup kitchen one day a week. This was about 10 years ago, and I still think about it from time to time. It's something I really loved doing. I had to stop because of health reasons. The place was run by a local church, and they had a group of regulars that worked there every day. Because of this, everyone had their own job or station that they worked every day. I was an outsider because I didn't go to church there, so I was basically just ended up doing wherever they put me for that specific day, and I did different things. So on this day, I was making and handing out tea. About halfway into the service, this middle-aged lady comes up in the middle and makes a beeline towards me. I have no idea who she is, but she looks very upset. Her eyes are wide, and she looks pale, and like she's about to cry. But before I open my mouth, she just says, You look like my son. I was taken aback, but was like, Oh, cool. She shook her head and said, He died a month ago. You could literally be his twin. You look just like him. She was clearly very upset. I honestly felt I needed to apologize that she saw me today, but I didn't know how to go about doing it. She shook her head and started crying. Almost had a heart attack when I saw you. I thought you were him. How old are you? I told her I was 25. She shook her head again and said that he was 28 and that he died from a heart attack. I ended up apologizing and told her that I believed that everything happened for a reason, which I regretted saying because it was stupid and I didn't know what else to say. She turned to walk away without taking any tea, but before she did, she looked back at me and said that God catches up to everyone eventually and that he finally caught him. I think about that sometimes. I also tend to sleep very poorly and often only sleep two or three hours at the most. So it means a lot of lights awake doing something or other than sleeping. A couple of years ago, I got into the habit of going out late to get something to eat and find a quiet place to sit and listen to stories on YouTube or the like. So that's what I was doing on this particular night. It was about three in the morning and I was on my way back home. And ironically enough, I had been listening to glitch in the matrix stories. I live in a small town and rarely encounter another person when I'm out this late at night and the roads are always empty. So I was on the highway and there wasn't any other car near me. Suddenly a bright yellow sports car comes roaring up behind me out of nowhere. Never did I see this car and it was very conspicuous. Bright yellow with green stripes down the sides and it was just suddenly there. The car pulls around and as it's passing me, I see a custom license plate. It just says glitch. I sat there with my mouth open and watched it drive into the distance. Never saw it since. We have two dogs and a cat. All three of them get fed early in the morning at the same time. Each one of them has their own dish with a specific plate that no one else uses. So one day Zoe's plate goes missing and we can't find it anywhere. It's not in the dishwasher, hidden behind or under anything, it's simply gone. Zoe is a six pound papillion. And this is a heavy glass plate. So she didn't just carry it off somewhere. We looked for this thing everywhere and couldn't find it. So we ended up just getting Zoe a new plate for her food. A few days later, that same plate goes missing also. No idea why, so we get a third. This one didn't go missing. However, a few months down the road, I was getting dishes out of the cabinet for dinner, and there was Zoe's first plate. Now you have to understand that I get dishes from there every day, and I put dishes there every day as well. It had not been there earlier that day, or before. I couldn't have missed it. Her plate also never gets put up there. Even after it's been washed, it just stays on the floor. The second one never showed up. No idea where that went. I work night shift on a medical slash oncology unit where it's not uncommon to have hospice patients. Back when I was working as a CNA, I used to hang out at the back nurses station near the oncology rooms and study for the NCLEX on slow nights. 
one extremely slow night, when the oncology rooms were all empty, I heard a clicking sound while I was reading. When patients are using a walker incorrectly, it makes a distinct sound against the tile, and the cadence matches that of someone walking. I look up to see which of the medical patients was awake and walking around, only to see no one there. I get up to investigate. I approach the first two rooms, and the clicking sound is definitely not coming from there. As I approach the doorway of the third room, the clicking sound gets closer, and when I get to the doorway, the clicking stops. I give up my search and return to studying. A few minutes later, the clicks resume, and I reapproach the door to the third room, and it stops again. I head back to my studies, and the clicking resumes, and before I can even sit down, I decide to check the rest of the rooms, rather than trying the third room again. The clicking continues. I'm reapproaching the third room, the clicking stops. At this point, I'm feeling a bit creeped out, and I'm just assuming my mind is playing tricks on me. I decide to head up to the front of the unit where the nurses are chatting, and think nothing more of it until a few nights later. A few nights after the event, my unit was having a particularly busy night. The other CNAs, as I was still prepping for the NCLX at the time, was pulled into a one-to-one -one about an hour into the shift, and all the nurses were maxed out at seven patients. I was the only aide on the floor, and the nurses were trying to get their 9pm med pass done, first and largest med pass of the shift. Needless to say, it was crazy. Of course, the family of a confused patient chooses then to leave for the night, causing abuela, or grandma, to sundown hard. Every five minutes, she's setting off the bed alarm, and she's too unsteady to be up without assistance. She's too confused to use a walker, and she's trying to clean the house, so she's moving in ways that are making her more likely to fall. After a few hours of this, and several calls to the doctor by the nurse, charge nurse, and house officer, the patient is put on one-to-one. -one. Both CNAs are now sitting with confused patients, and the nurses are maxed out. At this point, it's about midnight. The nurses are either charting or working on their midnight med pass. The room I'm sitting in is close enough to the nurse's station that I can hear the call light system at any time the patient calls. While Abuela is continuing on with her confused behavior, I hear a bathroom alarm ring on the call light system. When a patient pushes the call button, the system beeps once about every one to two seconds. When the patient pulls the bathroom cord for assistance getting off the toilet, the system beeps four times a second. The majority of patient falls occur in the bathroom, hence the more annoying sound to direct priority. The bathroom alarm is continuing to ring and ring. Why the hell aren't the nurses answering the call light, I ask myself. Where the hell are they? The nurses are carrying portable phones, roughly the size of an old Nokia, just not as durable, which ring with the call lights. Are the phones not working? Sometimes it happens. What feels like 15 minutes later, the bathroom alarm is still ringing. And at this point, I'm surprised there hasn't been a code fall announced. Finally, the nurse comes into the room and I tell her that I'll go back. As long as I'm out the room, the nurses can't leave, so the patient can still be safe. As soon as I step out of the room, I realize that I'm not hearing the call light system. I'm hearing a telephone in one of the patient's rooms, loudly. It's not a ring like a pickup ring, but rather a non-stop ring. One that I've never heard these kind of phones do before nor since. The ring is coming from the opposite direction of the nurse's station. It's coming from down the hall in the oncology room. Not just any room, but the furthest room. I begin heading towards the sound. And as I get to the oncology rooms, they're all dark and absent of patients. As I approach the room in question, I can see the phone light up as it continues its drawn out ring. As I step out the room, I feel a shiver go down my spine and I physically shudder. I've never felt this feeling before. As I walk across the room, I feel someone staring at the back of my head. It feels as though someone is pouring out every ounce of hatred and rage into that stare. 
Words cannot do justice to explain the feelings directed at me. As I walk around the empty bed, I pick up my pace. I pick up the phone and slam it down and run out the room. As soon as I cross the threshold, I feel physically relieved. No hatred or rage being directed at me. I quickly walked back to Abuela's room and let the nurse finish her med pass. This unfortunately was not the last time I had to deal with this ghost. Occasionally, when I have to go into that room to grab extra equipment or a chair, I can feel the angry presence. Luckily, the ghost is usually pretty dormant whenever there's a patient in the room. Not always, but usually. I've had a few patients complain about not being able to sleep or relax in that room in particular, or they would complain about nightmares. Once, and thankfully only once, the malevolence could even be felt during the day. On a few occasions, I've sent co-workers into the room for various reasons and then asked them about it afterwards. Most of them have agreed that something doesn't feel quite right in there. This happened about two years ago, but it still sends chills down my spine whenever I think of it. There's a local factory that was made in 1890, and it opened in 1891 as a sewing factory where people handcrafted detachable collars and cuffs. In 1999, it was repurposed as a bunch of little consignment shops throughout the whole building in each room. Today, there is still the original huge elevator shaft with rickety gated doors. One night, me and my friend decided to go and check out one of the bookshops that just opened up there. We headed downstairs, went and left the store, and eventually took a break on one of the benches before leaving. To our knowledge, no one else was in the building, or at least in the basement with us. So we're sitting there, and the way the bench is positioned is flat up against the wall, where you can see all the way up the hallway, with the flight of stairs to our right, and one of the shops to our left. While we're sitting there and talking, I started feeling this uncomfortable feeling, and tried telling my friend I wanted to leave to hurry up, because I just didn't like this feeling. He told me to calm down, and that we'd leave in a minute, and the uncomfortable feeling went away. As we were about to get up and go, we saw someone come around the corner and start approaching us. We figured it was the maintenance worker, but that feeling of uncomfortableness came over me again. Yet, worse this time. Now the way he turned the corner was completely unnatural. He walked to the end of the hallway, stared at the wall in front of him for a solid five seconds, and then turned towards us, and took a brief pause before coming our way. The way he turned the corner though, it seemed as if he knew we were there, and was completely unfazed when he saw us. I would say that's plausible, but we were being fairly quiet, and the hallway was a solid 30 to 40 feet long, so we'd have to be talking decently loud for him to hear us. I went into panic mode, but my friend kept their cool. The place was still open. We weren't breaking any rules, just sitting on this bench. My friend calmly looked at him and said, Hi, how are you doing? And the man didn't say anything. He just kept walking towards us at a somewhat rapid pace. I remember looking at him in the eyes. He had zero expression, not anger, not happiness, nor confusion, just nothing. It was severely unsettling. Even after my friend said something to him completely unfazed, he was just on a mission to get us. You'd assume if this was a maintenance worker, he'd either tell us it's time to leave, or say hi back or something, anything. But nope. Just this blank, expressionless face making his way towards us. After he didn't respond to my friend and started getting close to us, we just gave each other this, we need to go look, and sprinted out of there. When we got out of the building and down the road, the uncomfortable feeling left me, and I started calming down. We didn't really talk about what just happened. We just went on our way back to my house. Ever since that night, I haven't been back to the factory or any of the shops there. Something about the man wasn't right, and it sent a chill down my spine seeing him. And it sends chills down my spine just typing this out. I'm a firm believer of the paranormal. And I can just about guarantee that what we saw that night wasn't human. At times throughout my life, I've had things mysteriously vanish, 
only to turn up days or even months later with no explanation as to where they've been or how they've reappeared. It's been a few years since anything like this has happened to me, until recently. For context, I'm a backpacker in Australia, and in March of this year, I headed to Kangaroo Island to volunteer in bushfire-affected areas with an organization called Blaze Aid. While there, I lived in a tent in their makeshift campsite, which was actually the local cricket club ground. My tent was a last-minute purchase, and I'd originally been told that they would have a spare tent that I could use. And then the day before arriving to camp, I was told I would need to buy one, which resulted in me having to buy the only affordable tent left in stock in Adelaide's Target at a $39 TP tent that slept four people. This tent, although pretty terrible quality, was spacious and allowed me to spread out all of my belongings. Bear in mind I live out of a few backpacks, so it was nice to have a floor drobe for once. As coronavirus became an issue in the rest of the world, we were isolated from all of it on that small island. But we were told, as interstate borders were shutting down, the future of camp was uncertain. If we have somewhere safe to go, we should leave. I had met a fellow volunteer, and he had offered me his spare room in his house in the city. And I decided to take him up on the offer to have somewhere safe and warm to wait out the pandemic until I could get home. Lol. Two days before leaving camp, it was a sunny, warm day. So the camp coordinators organized a barbecue for everyone, and we set up one long table outside in the sun. My friend and I got there a little later than everyone else and the only seats left were on the side facing the sun. So we both agreed to go and grab our sunglasses so that we could actually enjoy the meal and talk to those sat opposite us. We ran to our tents, hers is next to mine, and looked for our sunnies. I pull everything out of my backpack, search through my floor drobe, even lift up the little mattress I have there, but I can't find them. I was kind of pissed, as they were new after losing my last pair in Perth. But I went and had dinner, making a mental note to make sure I put my sunglasses somewhere specific in my bag when I did find them. The next day, I take everything out of my tent to get ready to pack up, empty my bags out, completely do all of my washing, remove the mattress and bedding, everything. No, sunglasses. I repack my bags several times before leaving and conclude that I must have lost them somewhere along the way and I just have bad luck with them. Fast forward to a week later, and I've moved into this guy's spare room. My room is in a separate little building at the end of his garden, and I've half unpacked all of my clothes, as I usually just take them out as and when I need them. But that's when it dawned on me that coronavirus was probably going to be around for a little while longer, so I might as well get comfortable and unpack fully. My big backpack is on the floor in the middle of the room. I open it, and there, on top of all my stuff, and my sunglasses. It was as if someone had just placed them there and zipped my bag back up. I was a little freaked out and messaged my friend who started freaking out too. I mean, I was glad to have found them and eventually just chalked it up to a weird experience. Then things got a little weirder. Not long after it was Easter, the guy I was staying with has a kid who he shares custody with his ex. He's a really nice kid, seven years old, very well behaved and a lot of fun to be around. Easter morning comes around and his dad has gone a little bit overboard with the Easter eggs. And this kid has a whole bucket load of them of all different sizes. Now this kid is great and all, but he's a little strange in the fact that he isn't really interested in chocolate. He likes it, but doesn't turn into a little sugar demon like most kids do when they have a bucket full of Easter eggs handed to them and he's more than happy to share them with us and isn't really fussed that much about actually eating them. He puts the bucket on his head and we play games in the living room and have a good day together. Then after dinner, his dad tells him he can have an Easter egg for dessert if he wants. He goes to his room, then comes back to the living room looking confused, saying that all of his smaller Easter eggs have vanished. We laugh it off saying he must have misplaced them or that they've fallen to the bottom of the bucket so we tip it out and sure enough, there are only medium and large eggs in there. We search his room, under his bed and between his sheets and there's nothing. We ask him if he's just tricking us and he starts to get upset, insisting he has no idea why they're gone or where. 
Our next thought was maybe the dogs ate them, as he has two chocolate labs. But there's no way the dogs would have managed to eat that many without us noticing, without tipping up the bucket. And they wouldn't have specifically only chosen the smaller eggs when there were much bigger ones to eat through. Even so, we kept an eye on the dogs and an eye for any foil in their poop, but there was nothing. When this kid was at his mum's, we did a full-on search of the house, thinking maybe he was just having a laugh or had forgotten where he put them. Nothing. Twenty or so small Easter eggs had just vanished. We still don't know what happened to them, and I never told the guy about my sunglasses thing in case it freaked him out. But I get the feeling the eggs will reappear soon, and questions will be raised once more. The first story takes place a few months ago, when I was playing with my Oculus Quest 2. I live in a two-story house, and when you come up the stairs, you enter into the main room. Next to the stairs is a wall with a door into the bathroom. The rest of the rooms are on different walls, and a bedroom is in a closet. As the main room is wide open space, it was the perfect place for me to play Quest 2. I was positioned in the center of the room, and the bathroom was to my left. Any Quest 2 owners will be familiar with the pass-through feature. For anyone unfamiliar with this feature, it basically lets you see into reality with the camera of the front of the headset. The cameras aren't in color, and the quality is a bit grainy. So I was playing Quest 2 with my stepbrother when he goes downstairs to do something. My sister is in her room, and I'm completely alone in the main room. My Quest Hub virtual environment is set to pass through so that I can see the room I'm in. I was about to open a game, when out of my peripheral vision I see what appears to be a head peeking at me from around the bathroom doorway. The head appears to be white with no facial features, although I couldn't tell its color, as pass through doesn't show color. I turned my head towards it to get a better view out of my head, but it slipped back into the bathroom. I couldn't play Quest 2 again that night. The next story is when my family was getting ready for our camping trip, and I was grabbing my bag which was next to the bathroom door. The door was to my right, and again out of my peripheral vision I saw movement in the bathroom. I turned to look at whatever created this movement, but there was nothing there. It couldn't have been a family member because they were all downstairs. So far I've seen this bathroom dweller a number of times. My only theory is that it's a ghost. My house is very old and it would make sense if a previous resident of the house passed away and their spirit lingers for whatever reason. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, though. The first hospital I worked at had a haunted room. It wasn't really a room, it was a larger mini unit with four beds and monitors that were used as a higher acuity area. The code blue call light would go on and off when no one was in it, and Biomedical had checked out several times, but couldn't find anything wrong with the system, and even after replacing it completely, it still happened. Equipment and people's personal items would go missing and turn up in there. Things would randomly fall over or move around. We had several patients who asked to be moved out of that room, because no matter what the thermostat setting was, they complained it was freezing. The scariest one happened to me when I had a dementia patient in that room, and while I was rounding on her, she asked me to close the door because of that scary man who keeps watching me. My wife told me this story. When she was in her teens, about 14 or 15, she and a few female friends were spending the night at her friend's house. They all went to bed around the same time. When they woke up, they were over a mile away from her friend's house in an orange groove laying on the ground. You're talking five teen girls, no drugs, no alcohol. Nobody could move them a mile away without waking them. None were known sleepwalkers either. My wife has always been a very light sleeper. I can't get her out of bed in the morning without waking her. Luckily, one of them had their phone on them and had to call for a ride. But here's what I find extra bizarre. My wife and her friends that I have asked this about and that she is still friends with completely accept it as something funny and brush it off. 
This is not something you brush off as a random and inconsequential thing. Maybe it's a lie, but they were all dead serious about it. It's almost to the point like they were brainwashed about the incident. This line of reasoning is not normal for a person, especially if it's not something that happens regularly. I would lose my mind trying to figure out how I ended up there. There's no logical explanation for how five girls can go to sleep with parents home and end up over a mile away in an orange grove. To this day, it is the one thing about my wife I can't understand and subconsciously bugs me because I want to know the truth more than anything. Whereas she, the person it happened to, couldn't care less. I don't think that's right. I've had a personal encounter with the paranormal. The first I remember was when I was a kid at my parents' house, maybe 10 or so. I was in the backyard with my headphones in, listening to music, most likely on my CD player, but could have been my talk girl. It was night, pretty dark, no street lights in our neighborhood, but the backyard landscape lighting was on. I looked up and down the yard. By the front entrance, I saw towards the back, Along the side of the house was a woman in white walking towards me. She had that classic white ghost appearance and a flowing but fitted dress. I noped back into the house as fast as I could. Never saw her before, never saw her again, or anything over there. Years later, my parents remodeled, and half of that section of the yard was taken up by the third bay to the garage. The house was built in 38. The neighborhood was from the late 20s to late 30s, maybe early 40s. It used to be fruit orchards, no mysterious or creepy history. We have a lot of local historians in the area. The closest thing we have to a ghost story is a teen being killed with farm equipment in an accident in a back shed at his parents' house a few blocks over in 1929. No idea what I saw or why, other than I assume a figment of my overactive imagination. At another time, it was my senior year in college, and in the photo darkroom, I was working on a project late at night. I was the only one there. I probably had headphones in, as I usually did, and I was walking towards the exit to check a finished print in the light, and I looked up from my print and saw a Civil War-era-looking soldier looking straight back at me. I gasped, jumped back, and after I blinked, he was gone. No one else came into the lab that night while I was there. The art building where the photo lab was in the basement was built in the old gardener's shed grounds. It was a residence and grounds before it became a college. I again assume it was my overactive imagination, but why it was that I have no idea. I'm not a big history buff. The prints I was working on were landscapes and it was Oregon, not what I think of as a civil war hotspot exactly. I've had several of what I think were sleep paralysis episodes. Usually I would just get myself back to sleep eventually. It's always someone or something standing in the corner of the room, in the shadows or just outside the sliding glass doors, so that I can see a silhouette through the closed curtains, opaque but not light blocking. One time I did manage to break through and subtly reached for my giant mag light that I keep by the bed, flung it, and lit up the corner of the room to reveal nothing there. Then there were those fever hallucinations. Those were freaky. Home from college for spring break. Ended up sick and miserable the whole week with a nasty cold and accompanying fever for good measure. One night there was a lady in white standing at the foot of my bed, totally different than the childhood one. And my bedroom is on the complete opposite side of the house as that side of the yard she was in. I remember sitting up and saying, Mum? Thinking my mum had come in to check on me. Realised it was not mum and panicked, but she vanished. The next night I saw my dad's severed head on the bed next to me, with a peaceful expression, no blood just laying there. As I woke up it gradually faded into the folds of the comforter. For my final story, my mum and I took a trip to New Orleans and had a blast. We were staying at the Le Pavilion Hotel, which has a ton of ghost stories. It was really cool and old. Our last night there, we went to bed, turned off the light beside the bed, and it was dark. A few minutes later, the lights flicked on. 
I wonder, half asleep, why Mum turned on the light. I didn't hear her get up or move, so she's not going to the bathroom or checking something. A minute later, it's still on. I roll over and start to ask why she turned the light on. At the same time, she rolls over and asks me why I turned the light on. We look at each other, then burst out laughing. We didn't see or hear any of the other ghosts there, but we did get our experience in before we left. The last place I worked, like so many other wards here in Denmark, had a six hour room where dead patients would stay for six hours before they checked again for signs of death and moved to the morgue, still attached to the hospital as it's a rather big one. Not sure if this is a thing in other countries, but anyway, the patients are required to have a call line within reach in case they wake up and are in fact not dead. So there are five to six call lines in the room. Anyway, it was an ER, and we had a fair amount of dead patients wait in that room over the years. Every now and then, and usually during a night shift, the call light would go on from that room, even without any patients there. You'd have to go down and then turn them off again, and sometimes they would go on again just as you left the room. Creepy as hell. I never liked going down there alone. It felt tense, thick. Technicians came and checked the connections and stuff, but everything worked without any problems. I had an experience about seven years ago. I was meeting up with a friend. He'd actually been an online friend for years that I met through gaming when I was a teen. He joined the military and ended up at a base near where I lived, so I picked him up at the airport and we decided to hang for the day. We hit up a GameWorks arcade, and after a few hours decided to head back to my car. I was parked in an underground parking garage, in the second underground floor. On the street level in the main lobby, there was an elevator to the lift, a bulletin board to the right, and stairs on the far left corner. A man and woman were reading something on the bulletin board, being the lazy young men we were, we took the elevator, step in, punch G2, and start talking about the games we just played, and watch the numbers change from 1 to G1 to G2. Step out the elevator, look around perplexed as we find ourselves on the ground floor. The couple in front of us, who were reading the bulletin board, turn around and gave us creepy stalker looks. We looked at each other and mouth, did that just happen? We head for the stairs and reach G2. And I turned to him and asked, you've felt the elevator move, right? Yep, felt it move down and stop. The number changed to G2. Yeah, then what the hell just happened? We've spoken to each other about this, and to this day, we don't have an explanation. It's probably not the scariest thing you've ever heard, but to me, it always gives me chills. I'm completely certain I felt it move and I vividly recall seeing the numbers change, so it had to have moved. I'd call myself insane if I'd have experienced this alone, but since I had a friend with me who also recalls the same details, I know it must have happened, and that something freaky was going on. I used to work for a Catholic hospital, before and after it was bought by a larger healthcare system. While I didn't witness any of these things myself, I do have two first-hand accounts of an incident involving a nun that committed suicide. Back before I was born, the nuns were very active at the hospital. They actually started the health care in our area, and the hospital continued to grow. Back in the 80s or early 90s, a nun decided to jump off the building and take her own life. Obviously, this caused quite an ordeal due to the Catholic Church. A family member of mine was employed at the hospital and had a window office. She was working in her office when she saw a large black flying thing fall past her window. It was the nun. Fast forward several years later, and a supervisor on night shift was making her rounds in the hospital. She entered a long hallway with only windows on one side. The hospital itself was probably 50 to 60 feet in length, 
with doors on either end, but no doors opposite the windows. As she was midway down the hallway, she felt something behind her and turned around. She witnessed a nun behind her, and thinking nothing of it, simply said, Oh, hello, before continuing down the hallway. Suddenly she stopped, as the realization hit her. She realized the nun was floating. She instantly turned back around to an empty hallway. Hospital doors are very loud when you open them, and she didn't hear any doors opening, allowing anyone to leave the hallway. This hallway was just below where the nun had decided to end her life. For the past week, I've been staying at my mum's while I transfer my belongings from my old apartment to my new one. As there are no Tim Hortons near her, I settled for McDonald's for my morning coffee needs. Each morning I've gone through the drive-thru, ordered a medium, paid and been on my way in under two minutes. Even with the usually quite crowded lines, this morning was different. When I arrived at my usual time, I found no one in the drive-thru. Two brown garbage pails blocked both lanes, and there were almost no cars in the lot, except for two parked at the very back. Strange, but I've seen stranger. I parked and went in. The doors opened, but the restaurant was deserted, save for one old dude nursing a coffee and doing a puzzle in a paper. Two young adults stood behind the counter as I approached, neither of them really moving or smiling or doing much of anything. What can I get you? One of them said, not even bothering with the usual pleasantries and smiles managers generally press service workers into saying. I ordered my coffee, put exact change on the counter, plus 20 cents, and the kid took it. Then I went to grab my coffee. The two kids working took ages to figure out the machine, and five minutes later, when I finally got my coffee, the order was wrong. It was black. I had requested cream and sweetener, but at that point I was getting a weird vibe and just wanted to leave. Curiosity, however, prompted me to ask, Hey, uh, so do you know why the drive through is closed? He stared at me for a few seconds and then said, Nope. There was still no one else in the restaurant in the few minutes I'd been there, and my desire to get the hell out of there was growing, so I hightailed it out of there. The creepiest thing that happened once I got back outside was the lot was full. Every single space had a car in it, but there was no one in the cars and no one in the lot, and no one in the restaurant aside from the older guy with the newspaper. One car sat idling at the drive through window, with a guy who was staring straight ahead, and there was no one at the window at all. On the other side of the McDonald's is a bath fitter place and a funeral home, both of which were closed at 7.30 in the morning, and on the other side a bakery which was also closed. Residential houses surrounded the area. There was nowhere else so many people could have gone to in that hour for no reason and left their car at the parking lot. I got the absolute worst full body shivers, got back into the car and took off really quick. I have no idea what that was about, what was going on, or if it was my coffee deprived brain not making sense of everything. But it was genuinely an unsettling experience. I've worked at a vet clinic for four years now. There was a clinical cat called Jingles who ended up passing overnight. It was really sad for all of us. Jingles was a real character, serious mischievous little thing. She passed December 24th, 2018. And ever since that day, we've all had an experience with Jingles. I was the one working Christmas, so sadly I found her. I called my co-workers to come and say goodbye and started filling out the cremation paperwork. I walked away from the computer for just a moment to just breathe came back and there was a bunch of random letters where I was typing. Jingle was notorious for walking and laying on any keyboard that she saw in use. Always was messing up our notes. I was speechless. I didn't even want to delete the letters. A few weeks later, I'm alone taking care of the boarders for the weekend. I had these four small dogs who were always very good and pretty quiet. So they would bark when I came in, but quieted down when they realized it's me. 
So I come in, they bark for a few minutes, then they calm down, and I was finishing mopping the floor around their kennels when two of them just go insane. They were both looking at the same area of the room, howling and barking like I've never heard them bark before. Jingles would stand right where they were, look and tease dogs. She was so unafraid of everything, it worried me sometimes. I said, Jingles, you troublemaker, go to bed. And like 30 seconds later, they stopped barking and were all totally fine. Had to be Jingles. I know these dogs well, and they are very calm for the most part. This other one is pretty funny. I smelled her ghost poop. Her poops were some of the nastiest smelling poops I've ever encountered, and I've smelled a lot of poops in my days. All I can say is her poops were foul enough to recognize. I walked into her old room where no cat had been in months to clean it for the new cat, and I was hit with her nasty poop stench. I've gone in there many times before to store things, so I know it wasn't always smelling like her poop. Even when she was alive, it didn't always smell like her poop. I had my co-workers come into the room and they agreed it was her foul poop. Jingles took a little ghost dookie. I'll end this with our new client, Cat, Ramen. We constantly see him playing like there's another cat with him. He stands on his hind legs, swatting at nothing, and acts like he's pouncing on something that isn't there. Stalks something that isn't there, and pretty much everything two cats would do together is what we see Ramen do with nothing. It's pretty interesting to watch, and we all agree Jingles is definitely still around. She knocks over alcohol bottles, squats Q-tips off the counter, sometimes dogs on the table will have a reaction like a cat just jumped up next to them. Love you, Jingles. You're one hell of a cat. When I first started working at the hospital, the charge nurse I made friends with on the oncology unit told me some ghost stories. One was about a little boy who died a long time ago from severe burns, when that was the pediatric ward. He said people started reporting seeing a little boy with bandages wrapped around his head, and they would die a day or two later. It sounds like a typical run-of-the-mill ghost story, until I was working on Medserg floor across the hospital one day. I had this patient whose condition was not improving, an old man with heart failure and arrhythmia. At one point during the day, I go in this man's room and he says, y'all need to do something about this little boy that keeps coming in here. Since I hadn't seen any kids running around, I asked him who he was talking about. He said the boy with all the bandages wrapped around his head. Needless to say, my heart sunk to my stomach and I looked around the room, somewhat excited but scared as well, since I had never experienced anything like that. I asked him if he said anything to him, and he said that he sticks his head out the wall up there, and smiles and asks if his pacemaker's working, and he pointed to the upper back corner of the room near the ceiling. Sorry to tell you guys that there was nothing there, but I can say 100% I was freaked out. He didn't see the boy again to my knowledge, but when I came back the next morning he had been transferred to the ICU overnight, and that is the only time in my life I have ever truly believed or come close to experiencing a ghost story. One Friday in September, four friends of mine and I were hanging out on a very foggy and mildly chilly evening with nothing to do as usual. We decided to go to the beach and have a fire. We've been going to this spot for years and knew the place pretty well. It's in a nice area and we've never really had any issues having fires there before. We arrived around 9.30 p.m. as it was getting dark, but there were still many people there hanging out by the water, fishing and having fires too. As we were choosing a spot, we noticed there was a light in the distance at the far left side of the beach. For some reason, this light, which was presumably a person, caught our eye, and we even had a short conversation discussing it. Normally, I wouldn't notice something as random as that, but for some reason, I was conscious of it the entire time we were hanging around the fire. I wasn't the only one. I could see one of my friends, Mark, looking over and keeping an eye on the light as well. Again, we acknowledged it, and went on chilling as usual and trying not to think of it. 
About half an hour later, Mark brings our attention to the guy with the light that is now walking by us 20 meters away. But when we look over, he started walking back to his faraway spot. For reference, he was sitting at least 100 meters away from us the whole time. Since we were in a decently large group, and the fact that Mark and I had brought our knives to split wood and shave off kindling to get the fire started, we felt pretty safe. On top of that, there were still a few people around us, so none of us were too weirded out. Even though it seemed like the man was probably just fishing or something, being the paranoid person that I am, I told Mark to warn us if the light moved again, as he was the only person whose seat was facing that direction. After chatting and feeding the fire for about an hour, it was getting late. We decided to finish up the last couple of logs and call it a night. As we're talking, Mark suddenly whispers, why is that dude coming up to us? We looked over, and sure enough, the man with the light was coming our way. He wasn't saying anything, just walking. I could see his pants at first. He was wearing jeans with regular work boots. Hey, I call out to him as he was 15 meters away. He elected to ignore us and kept walking towards us without breaking a stride. What's up? They say to him again. This time he responded, Could I warm up by your fire? While continuing to close the distance between us, considering the COVID pandemic and it being late, I decided it wouldn't be a great idea for the stranger to join us. I told him exactly that, and finally he stopped walking. He was roughly five meters away at this point, close enough for the fire's light to bring him into view. He was an older, raggedy looking guy, wearing a flannel jacket with a hood and hat on. As he stopped, he said, all right, I fell in the water, I am wet. Although I could not see him very well, I could tell he wasn't wet at all. His boots were still the very light tan color that work boots are, and if they were wet, they most definitely would have been a shade darker. I continued to say no, and he finally turns around and starts walking away, frustrated back to his spot far off in the corner of the beach, right where he claimed to have fallen in. If he was wet, why didn't he just leave? Why would he go sit back in the spot where he'd fallen in? Normally I wouldn't just leave somewhere because of something like this, but I had a really bad vibe from this guy. So we packed up our stuff, put out the fire and left. The path back to our cars had us passing over a bridge that overlooks the area of the beach the man was sitting at. We looked over and we could see him just sitting there with the light doing nothing. On the walk back, we got more and more scared and put together the pieces of what had just happened. The man was sitting there for hours and then walked by us to check us out. He waited another hour until every single other person, including security, was gone for the beach before approaching us. Even while he was walking up to us, he didn't have any intention of saying anything before reaching us. It took me saying, hey, twice before he even replied. He wanted to get close enough to us without noticing, and once he realized we saw him, he made the fake excuse to try and have us let us near him. There was always the possibility that he was harmless, but I have little doubt in my mind he came with sinister intentions. He didn't look harmless, and he had no reason to talk to us and certainly wasn't wet. I'm certain we were very close to something really bad happening, and this situation really freaked me out. Who knows what would have happened if we were in a smaller group, or if he decided to keep walking towards us, or worse, if we had let him in that close to us. Always keep your guard up when you're out late, and remember guys, don't talk to strangers. There was an abandoned hospital near my grandma's town. It was a tuberculosis hospital, and many people died there. But the bodies were never claimed, so they were buried in unmarked graves behind the hospital. From the people I have spoken to in the town, it was a miserable place to work. Some of the staff suffered from mental illness. One of the nurses ended her own life in the isolation ward in the 50s. Shortly after that, the hospital was shut down. It would be rented out to host gatherings and events, but quickly fell apart. People reported screaming, wheelchairs moving around and doors opening and closing, as well as strange odors coming from the building. 
When I was younger, I remember checking it out. We didn't go inside, but we heard wheels squeaking and screaming. Keep in mind the nearest houses were kilometers away and it was up in the hills. We always got a creepy feeling when we passed by it, like we were being watched. Then one night in the mid 2010s, the hospital mysteriously caught fire. The gas lines and powers had been disconnected since the mid 70s and an investigation revealed that it was not caused by arson. No one knows the true cause of the fire, but the belief is that it was the work of the souls trapped inside. In preschool, I would always hang out with a girl named Alex. She was my best friend at the time, and I would always go home and tell my mum what Alex and I did that day. But my mum got worried because I told her Alex would always wear the same clothes to school every day. At a parent teacher conference, my mum brought in clothes for Alex, but my teacher said that they didn't have an Alex at the class, but they had noticed that I was talking to someone who wasn't there. One of the teachers told us about how there was an Alex in class last year, but she had died of cancer, if I remember correctly. A brain related disease and she brought out a picture of Alex and I confirmed that was my friend that I'd been talking to. We got paranormal experts involved in everything and they suggested that I told Alex that I couldn't play with her anymore to prevent her from getting too attached to me. So I did and I never saw Alex again after that. Most of what I know of the story is what my parents told me but I vividly remember Alex. It's nothing that scares me. It's pretty cool, really, that I was the one she decided to hang out with at her old preschool. I grew up with a strange mum. We don't really talk anymore. She was a paranormal investigator while I was growing up. There are loads of stories there. When I was about three, there is video footage of me coming downstairs as angry as I could be. Not a temper tantrum, hissed. In the video, I kept yelling at my mum that they won't let me play with my toys. She tried to ask me who, and I just kept angrily yelling, telling her that they wouldn't let me play with my toys. We didn't get a cat until I was four before that, and there was some kind of cat creature in the house. I had seen it in my mother's closet once. Another time, I remember being awoken in the middle of the night by a cat yowling in my playroom, which is the next room over and I could see a shadow under the door before I opened it and heard a hiss. Upon opening the door, there was nothing there. As I got older, things got stranger. After my mother got back from the catfish plantation, strange things started happening. We could hear someone running up and down the stairs at night. Shoes would be thrown down the stairs, and my most vivid memory of the time was me sitting on my mum's bed. We had no pets at the time, and it was just me and her. Her bathroom was attached to their bedroom, and she was the kind of woman that had 20 almost empty bottles on the side of the tub. While watching Barney one day, it sounded as if someone had struck their arm out and just swiped all the bottles into the tub at once. My mother came around the corner yelling, Jeremy! It turns out Jeremy was the name of a young man who was the slave at the plantation she had visited. He had fallen off the back of a hay wagon and died. After that day, she got back in her car, drove back to the plantation, and all the strange things stopped. Also, she now believes she's an alien. So there's a whole other story there. Also, we don't speak anymore. She tried to tell my son could heal himself of hepatitis C that his birth mum gave him. And I hung up on the crazy lady and haven't talked to her since. She also believes that the alien encryption sun god Ra is in sending her messages and that we're about to move into the fourth form of being. She thinks it's her job to let people know. By now, she might be running a cult. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. My mom worked day shift at a hospital for a while and she would leave before 7 a.m. So my sister and I would take turns lying with the dog when she'd leave because he couldn't be shut in her room alone. Anyway, my mum and I would often feel a small animal, specifically a cat, walking on the mattress near our legs and curl up next to us. 
We didn't have cats at that point. Nothing was ever on the bed when we'd check. One day, my sister and I were talking with mum in her room when she started banging on the side of her recliner, where she was sitting, and yelling at the dog to go away. She crawled out from the other side of the bed when she went to extend the leg rest of the recliner, a shadow darted out from underneath and zipped across the room. We all saw it. We think it was one of our late cats who died around Halloween 2005, because he was very close to her before my younger sister and I were born. I woke up one morning and went downstairs. My dad, stepmom and sister were all in the living room and stared at me in complete disbelief. They explained I'd already come down the stairs five to ten minutes earlier, and they all said good morning as I walked past them without replying into the computer room. I would have assumed sleepwalking, except they would have had to see me walk out of the computer room and come back upstairs. I was playing around with lucid dreaming at the time, and trying to have an outer body experience, so make of that what you will, even though I don't remember any of it. I have a story that happened around 15 years ago. I'm 40 now, a native from Beaver Lake, Cree Nation, number 131, Northern Alberta. During the winter months, the reserve has round dances. Once summer has gone and all the powwows are done, fall comes in, followed by Old Man Winter. It's about late October now, there was a round dance going on. Pretty much everyone goes from different reserves around the province. Drummers, singers, dancers, 50-50s, and prizes and giveaways at the end of the night. Usually by 4 a.m. it's all over. I had decided not to go. I always go, but I was on a 420 mission this night. It was getting dark. I had borrowed my cousin's bike to do this mission since I was living with them after I had a falling out with my estranged family. I don't have anything to do with them to this day, still, some 15 years later. I also need to say that it is true. Natives have medicine that can summon or bring creatures from another realm. The natives have a word for this. I don't know what it is, nor how it's spelled. But from my understanding, this little man or creature is called an up chi nis, meaning little man or being. So I was sitting on the deck of my uncle's home. You see, I was making my way home, and I just happened to look to my right, where my other uncle's house was. I can't explain the reason why I looked, but I did, which I instantly regretted doing, since I had seen an up chi nis years before. They only come around when you're doing bad things, apparently, such as drinking, smoking, or drugs, or just being an overall complete ass and making life hard. Needless to say, I pedaled harder and faster. It was hard, though. My cousin's bike was one of those Harley bikes with the big wheels built like a Harley, but with pedals. If you have strong legs, it's not a problem. And I got scared because of my own experience with this little man creature. Some stories depict it as a three foot tall, sometimes solid black mass, other times describing it with little horns on its forehead, like a satyr. I made it home, but did not tell even my uncle or the family that I lived with. We call him Napiyu. In Cree, it means the man. My uncle is a medicine man. He taught me how to do it as well. The next day I asked around with my cousins to see if they were home, and I got a response that made me feel pale and weak at the knees. No one was home, telling me that all of them went to the round dance the night before. After this I explained what I saw, mistaking an upchiness for my little cousin. I don't know what became of it, but to watch him jump off the rail to the deck and into the house with no lights or nothing was enough to make me go home so fast. What went on in that house, I still don't know, but I'm guessing something bad. I know this since my other uncle was not a medicine man, but very mischievous, and would leave you with his kids while he and his wife would go off gallivanting, basically having a great time at my expense. I'm married now. It's been 14 years, and I'm happy. 
I haven't seen the creature again. I was taking care of an elderly patient, a very, very elderly patient, actually the oldest person I've ever taken care of. I don't remember why she was admitted, but it was minor, and she was due to go home the next day. She was A&O times three, a very sharp lady, and she and I were having a nice little chat, and I was getting ready to wrap things up when she said, I just want you to know who that little girl is standing behind you. The hair on the back of my neck rised up. I ran through a quick assessment again. She knew which hospital she was in, yet she was seeing invisible children in her room. What? I assure her there's no one else in the room. She was very nonplussed about it. I go out to the nurse's station and have the, my patient is hallucinating ghost children, please help me conversation with my charge nurse. And she goes, oh, are they in room 26? Yeah. I figured. She's the third or fourth person who we've seen witness children in that room. We live in the mountains, and there's a little store, a five minute drive from our house that closes at 9pm. My roomie and I wanted to go to get her beers. It was about 8.40. I agreed and we drove down to the store and I joked with the guy working there about their evening rush, looked at my phone and saw it was 8.50, and said something like, well, at least we're not bugging you right at closing time or something. We get back to the car and started driving home. This store is off a main road. I mean a main road, but not really, just the main drive through our area. No street lights, heavily wooded two lanes, which we drove back on to turn left. We live in a small community off the right side of the road. About half a mile from where we turned onto the main road, there are three entrances into this community, which is just a collection of houses in a spider-web-like sprawl of roads. All three are small roads on the right side of the road, and there are no other driveways or anything. The first entrance is quite a sharp drop on the main road and is easy to miss. It's the sketchiest one to take, and we often miss it because it's around a sharp turn and comes out of nowhere. The second entrance is the one we all usually take when coming from the direction we're driving in. It's across a flagpole that's lit up with a spotlight. It's pretty much the only light on the road. It's definitely not something you could miss. The entrance also slopes down into the park. The third entrance is like three miles past the first two, way down at the front of the park it has a sign for the park, and when you drive in, you get this entrance, the road slopes upwards, while the other two entrances slope quickly downwards. You get the mental image, I hope. So we turn left onto the main road. We're talking about whatever. We're not high or drunk or anything, and we were paying a reasonable amount of attention. Then we see a car approaching from the right, the headlights coming through the trees towards us, but it's coming from the wrong angle to be approaching the main road from one of the roads that slopes downwards. This car is coming from above where it should be. We both say, what the hell? And then we pass the third bottom entrance into the park, which is where the car is coming from. And why is it coming from a higher angle than we expect? We should have taken about one minute from turning onto the main road to turning right into the first two entrances. We did not pass the first two, nor the flagpole lit up by spotlights. We even passed the third entrance without realizing what it was, because it was about three miles further than where we thought we were. I looked at the clock right when we realized we had skipped about three miles of road and it was 9.15 p.m. We had literally left the store at 8.50 and driven about two minutes, lost three miles and 25 minutes. We have literally driven this exact same stretch of road hundreds of times. We have lived in the current houses for three years and this immediate area our whole lives. There was no way we just zoned out and drove three miles down a super windy road past spotted flagpole without noticing and spent 25 minutes doing it. We lost 25 minutes of time and are very freaked out. According to my girlfriend, who has a really hard time believing in anything supernatural, her sister has been haunted since she was a child. Everything from seeing a small child run in front of the TV, 
multiple people seeing the same tall man lurking in the dark, to a light bulb exploding in her bedroom and the door slamming and locking itself. The light in that room stopped working and every electrician they hired couldn't figure out what was wrong. At the time of this story, they were in the process of moving out of the house and had no furniture left in it. Fortunately for my curiosity and the relevance of this story, she was also in the room. At this point, only me and one other person who I thoroughly trusted were in this room, holding a Ouija board, specifically the planchette. And I trusted them enough not to move it. So I asked if there was anything following her that might want to speak. My girlfriend's sister freaked out for a second and made it very clear that she did not want to be a part of this at all. But then the planchette moved to yes. We asked it a few more questions. Will you speak to us? Will you stay with us if she leaves the room? No. How old are you? None. The question was very confusing because according to every person in the family, they'd all seen a very tall man. Does that mean she was nine when you started following her? Yes, it replied. At this point, she noped out the room. The moment she stepped out, the planchet straight moved to goodbye and we couldn't speak to it anymore. But then I had a great idea. Let's take the Ouija board to her house and try it there. We convinced that poor girl to come with us on the condition that she would be able to put in her headphones and drown out whatever we were saying. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. We arrived at the house and set up the board on a small island counter in the kitchen. We waited to turn the lights off, so she retreated to the kitchen pantry with another person and turned the lights on in there. Can we speak to the entity we spoke with at the last house? Yes. Are you the same entity following her around? Yes. At this point, I wanted proof. I wanted something solid that I could take away from this experience and say without a doubt that there is something beyond our understanding and point to this as proof, at least to myself. Will you move something in this room? No. Will you move something if I am the only one in this room? No. Will you move something if she was the only one here? Yes. Then I had an idea. It was crucial that nobody in the pantry hear what I was about to say. So I say it very quietly. Could you shut the pantry light off? There was a very uncomfortable silence as the other people around me waited to see what would happen. The planchette began to move to yes, but it dragged off the board and towards the pantry. There was a loud slam in the pantry. The lights went out and everyone inside screamed and fell out. The next moment was one of panic, confusion, and at least for me, achievement. Whatever the hell had just happened in that pantry was exactly what I had been looking for. Something real that I could point to and say, this is how I know. After the two had caught their breath, they both told me that there was a wooden board on the top shelf leaning against the wall. According to them, the board flipped out of the wall and slammed the shelf, flipping onto the floor. If I remember correctly, it hit one of them and left a bruise. They weren't sure how the lights went out, one possibility is that in a panic to leave the room, one of them bumped against the light switch, but the moment had been too chaotic to really tell beyond a doubt why the light switched off. 70% of the group was ready to no pound, but there were a few of us, including myself, that wanted to bring the board into the room that had the most activity. It was the same room with that light bulb that had exploded, the same room that the dogs would never go near, and the same room that children would avoid looking at when they passed. Me and two others decided to use the board there. Upon walking into the room, it felt like a heavy blanket had been laid upon me. It felt like the sinking feeling when the love of your life tells you to piss off. It was almost hard to breathe, like when your bathroom fills up with steam, except it was very cold. Me and the other two sat down and started asking questions, except there was something very different. Before, the planchette had been moving slowly and deliberately across the board, but now it was moving so fast that it would almost fly off the board. In fact, at one point, it slipped out from under my fingers and kept going. 
The last question we asked is what its name was. They began to spell out G O D. And at this point, two other people noped out and left the board immediately. I told it we had to go and moved it to goodbye. When we left the room, we found out that the other girl that had been in the pantry had to leave the house and was throwing up outside. When I asked her why, she said that the air had felt so heavy that she began getting nauseous. This experience was, without a doubt, the most terrifying and exhilarating of my life. It was exactly what I was looking for and more. However, one thing stuck with me that is more terrifying than anything else, even the slamming board in the pantry, the implications of which still send a wave of terror down my back at every thought. Just before I left the room, I asked if it would be willing to stay with me if she went home. It said yes. I used to work night security as a patrolman in this old hospital. Our cubicle was set up outside the hospital as it was all fenced off, but it was fairly popular for people to try urban exploring within it. As you can imagine, our task was to ensure that people never got in in the first place. We had a whole section of cameras in our little unit where we could see pretty much anyone coming in or out. There were some blind spots and we were supposed to go out and walk the perimeter every hour, which we did. It would only be one of us. And of course, night shift is when these people tend to come to do their exploring. The hospital itself didn't have much of interest left in it. It had been abandoned for so many years, but papers, desks, chairs, and the like still persisted within its walls. It was a damp, dusk, and humid place, pretty much one of the worst places you could possibly want to work. But fortunately for me, I only had to be in there about 10 minutes every hour. They had only been working there a few months at this point. Nothing remotely interesting had happened other than having to ferry out some teenagers who thought they'd try and smash a window. I caught them by chance walking my usual route and instead of calling the cops, saw their terrified faces on their 15 year old bodies and told them to just leave and said that if they ever returned, there'd be serious consequences. I never saw them again, not unless they broke in without me noticing. So as I'm doing my usual patrol, I have to go into the building. There are a couple of doors, but they're all locked and the only one we tend to use is the main entrance. We go in and just to the left are a set of stairs, which takes us up every part of the hospital. We have to go through and around and back to this main section to go up to the next floor, as the other stairs are locked and have stayed locked for a long time. So I'm doing the usual rounds of the five floors. I'm on the third floor and quite bored listening to a podcast when I hear something behind me. Now to set the scene, I have a flashlight. It's extremely dark because the windows have been partially boarded up and any external light is only vaguely creeping through. I just about crap a brick. There should be no one in here with me. And obviously there is now and that's fear inducing. As I spin my flashlight round, I quickly glance, but there's no one. I turn off my podcast and keep walking around in silence. I stand there for a few minutes, seeing if I can see a light or hear someone. But when I don't, I just call out, security, show yourself. But there's still no one. Slightly disheartened, I tell myself that if there is someone in here, they've got no way of escaping, as I didn't lock the door as I came in. So they'd either have to knock and beg to come out, or I'll see them in the next hour. I make my rounds up to the fifth floor and nothing's happening. But just as I make my way to the second floor and I'm descending the stairs, do I hear something on the second floor as well, on the doors to the right of me, like a wind that had caused the doors to swing ever so slightly. So I peek through the glass into the gloom of the second floor and see nothing, but it's my job. So I push the doors open 
shine my flashlight around and quickly peek to see if I can see anyone hidden behind some of the beds or chairs or something. There's nothing. I do a complete sweep of the second floor one more time as there's no way if there was someone in there that had anywhere else to go but find no one. I'm really freaking out at this point. All that I do is want to get down to my hut and just ignore the world for another hour. I start making my way back, but before I hit the door, there's a small curtain which I can hide behind. So I decide that I'm gonna turn off my flashlight and hide there for a few minutes, just listening to see if there's someone there. I'm not gonna lie. The moment I turned my flashlight off and felt the gloom and darkness overcome me, I genuinely felt quite scared, which is something I usually don't feel on my jobs. I waited to see if I could hear any signs of life. And after about five minutes of pure boredom and fear, I get up. And just as I'm about to turn my flashlight on, do I hear a giggle from behind the curtain. I instinctively punch the curtain, but it doesn't travel very far. So if there was someone behind it, they didn't get hit. I burst through it and look around the empty room. There's no one here. I do one more thorough sweep, this time believing that Satan and his minions have come to claim my soul, bricking every step, but didn't find a damn thing. I go back to my little hut and didn't work, at least not inspect the inside for the remainder of the day. The next day, when I was speaking to my relief, I asked them if they'd seen anyone or heard anything unusual in the building which was the first time I'd ever asked such a question. My relief asks if I'm referring to the ghost, and I casually say that I didn't know what he was talking about. He proceeds to tell me that others have reported seeing and hearing a small child within the hospital walls on different floors, that it's quite playful and excitable, and to not buy into their nonsense. I give him a hearty laugh and tell him that I agree with him, and he's on his way home. I quit shortly after that. I think a cat was haunting our old place. I never owned the cat that's haunting us. My mailman has seen it as well as other neighbors, and he commented on what a gorgeous big marmalade cat we had that he saw at the window when he dropped off the mail, and wanted to know if said kitty was a boy because he had a girl getting fixed soon and was considering having a litter before the procedure. We told him we have a tuxedo kitty and a tortoise shell kitty, no large marmalade. I think we hurt his feelings and he thought we were lying. He wasn't the same to us after that. My neighbors have complimented the big bright orange cat in the window. We know the previous owners never had cats, only dogs. My brother lives in another town and when visiting him, I actually saw the damn thing and thought it was real. I saw it and my first logical thought was, hey, where the hell is the litter box? If he has a cat, he'd have one and food. I was convinced his carpets were gonna go to crap and mention that when he came out the shower. He looked at me like I had three heads. I found out later from a girl who stayed that she saw it once as well. So did it follow me from my home to my brother's? We have no info on the people who lived there previously. No one in my family has ever owned a cat like that, and I only saw it the once, but people still see it on occasion. Oh, and having crazy tortoise shells, we have no clue if the live kitties interact with the dead kitties, because they are notoriously nuts.